Jace, Everglade Brides Book 1, by Ava Benton. Chapter 1 Jace The thing about being a lion was the constant hunger. I mean complete, I can't think of anything else but eating right now hunger. The sort of hunger that doesn't go away. And that hunger was always tied in with the need to hunt, or maybe it was the other way around. Maybe hunting, stalking, praying was my true nature, and hunger came along with that. No matter the reason, it was a real pain in the ass. Or tail. Ha ha. I'll be here all week, folks. I shook my head at my own joke as I tread lightly through the swamp. My domain. Other animals might think they were on top, and maybe they were when I wasn't hunting. But once I stepped foot into the shadows beneath the low-hanging, mossy trees, it was mine. And everybody knew it. I'd already eaten my fill for the night, even though the sound of smaller, weaker animals scampering off into the darkness stirred my need to chase, trap, kill. I had to control my impulses, as my dad regularly reminded me. So I let it go. I hated when his voice sounded in my head. I heard enough of him when he called me in to talk with him, which was more than I liked. Much more. I let out a low growl, irritated. The trees seemed to quiver when I did that. Maybe it was just my imagination. That morning's meeting with Dad still weighed heavy on my mind. You've come of age. Actually, you were of age three years ago, but refused to accept the responsibility on your shoulders. Dad had shaken his head at me, looking disappointed as always. I don't know what you want from me, I'd argued. It was an old argument. He'd been on my back for years. I can't just force myself to find a lifelong mate. It's not the kind of thing I can control. If I haven't met her, I haven't met her. His irritation was obvious. Who's to say you haven't met her already? But you're too busy living life the way you live it to settle down. And what's wrong with the way I live my life? I'd ax in a near growl. Don't show me your temper, he'd warned, looking about as pissed as I'd felt. You might be an adult, but I'm still your father and the head of this clan. And you'll take my place one day, and you need a mate. End of discussion. End of discussion. It didn't matter that I was way too young to settle down with just one mate for the rest of my life. What a r ridiculous idea, incidentally. The thought that men and women had to pair off for the rest of their lives. And what did that have to do with the sort of leader I would be? It made no difference. None. I had been a leader my entire life. I never needed a woman by my side to convince others to follow me, to listen to my advice. Besides, if a mate was a requirement for leadership, why wasn't my father overthrown or forced out of his position when my mother died? I had a sneaking suspicion he just wanted to see me settle down and stop sleeping with anybody who looked good to me. Well, he could keep trying. Good luck to him. I let out a roar, not the loudest I could get by any means, but enough to cause even more scampering in the area. I let them go, all of them. I wasn't hungry anymore, not for food anyway. My apartment complex sat just beyond the edge of the swamp. A pretty convenient arrangement, and exactly why my cousins and I had chosen to live there. The three of us took an entire floor, renovating it into three large apartments instead of the dozen that were once there. Sure. We each paid four times the rent we would have, but we wanted the space. We needed it. I'd left my clothes in a shady spot by the edge of the tree line, and when I shifted back to human form, 
I was quick to pull on the jeans and tee that sat there. How many wardrobes worth of clothes had I gone through in the early days before I could control my shifting? A man didn't shift into a lion without shredding his clothes, no matter how big he was. And I was always big, tall, broad, thick-muscled without even trying. It was a characteristic of the shifters. Even so, there was no comparison with the size I got to when I took on my lion form. The sky was dark. Good. The closer to party time, the better. I needed to get out there and get my dick wet. Dad wanted me to find a mate. Well, I had to keep trying, didn't I? It was only right. I snickered as I walked across the parking lot, flip-flops slapping against the pavement. I was alone out there, my sense of smell just as strong while in human form as it was in lion form. I didn't smell any threats. Even though the human world knew about the presence of shifters and had for the most part accepted us, mostly because they knew it was in their best interest to live side by side instead of as enemies, there were still outlying factions who refused to accept our presence. They weren't even the biggest threat, since most of them were all talk and no action. They could boast and brag all they wanted about what they'd do if they were in charge, namely wiping shifters off the map. When faced with one like me, or a bear like my cousin Cord, or a tiger like my cousin Levi, they backed off mighty quick, usually with a big wet spot in the front of their pants. No, I was more concerned with the collectors. Even in my head, they got a capital C in their name. Humans with enough money to pay hunters to gather us for their private collections. What they did with us once we were theirs, I had no idea. Rumors ranged from slavery to keeping us caged like zoo animals. I didn't have any desire to find out. Hey, Jace. I couldn't help smirking when I ran into Lola as she left for the night. She wore the white button-down and black pants so many servers wore. She waited until she got to work to put on the cheesy vest and tie. Chain restaurant. Hey, Lola. Looking good tonight. She rolled her eyes. Yeah, I'm a real sex bomb in this crap uniform. Underneath it, more like. Stop it. She pushed me, one hand on my chest. I didn't move, of course. She was maybe a hundred pounds. Not like she was trying to move me, anyway. She just wanted an excuse to touch me. I could sense things like that. It was sort of uncanny. I reminded myself of one of my many rules. Don't flirt with girls you already slept with. But I lived in Lola's building. We ran into each other all the time. And if I didn't flirt, she'd wonder what was wrong with me. She might think I was mad at her. I didn't want that. Flirting was my nature. If I stopped, it would be like water not being wet anymore. And she was on her way out, so I could wave her off and go up to my place without things getting sticky. I heard music coming from behind Levi's door, which I passed on the way to my own. He was always listening to his tunes at full blast. His current obsession was 70s rock. He went through phases like some people went through significant others. He'd be super into it for weeks, even months, then drop it in favor of something else. Swing music, jazz, punk, Motown. They all came and went. Cord was the quietest of the three of us. I almost never heard anything from his apartment, except when he was pissed. He had a hot temper, so when something or somebody provoked him, all bets were off. If he got cut off in the parking lot or somebody pissed him off at the supermarket, he'd slam doors for hours. He'd already replaced the kitchen cabinets twice since moving in two years earlier. And then there was me. 
I didn't have anything about me that set me apart the way those two did. Well, maybe the whole, my father's the clan leader thing. That could have been my one big trait. And since the Swampwater clan, of which my cousins and I were a part, was the biggest and most respected clan in Florida, I was sort of a big deal. Not like I gave a shit. It was all the same to me. Though it did help me have a little fun. What woman wasn't into power? And shifters had a sort of allure on their own. Human women wanted to say they'd been with a shifter, an animal. The closest any of them would get to bestiality. To feel totally taken over, powerless under something much stronger and more powerful than they were. It was a thrill. Something they could brag to their girlfriends about over brunch. Shifter plus virtual royalty equaled more women than I could handle. And that was saying something, because I could handle a lot. I jumped in the shower, hot and sticky from my time in the swamp. I could still taste a little blood in my mouth from the fresh kill I'd bagged out there. The swamp was our place, the boys and me, along with other shifters from the area. The ones our clan was friendly with, anyway. There were a few we didn't like to see straying into our territory and vice versa, but there hadn't been any big blow-ups in a couple decades. Before I was born, I was toweling off after a quick, cold wash-up when I heard Levi's customary knock at the door. I should have known he was on his way over, since my walls had stopped vibrating thanks to him turning off his music. He didn't wait for me to answer. He never did. How was it out there? He flopped into an easy chair, immediately flipping through my latest car magazine before I even answered. His brain was always going in a million directions at once. He couldn't stand being still, silent, quiet. It was against his nature. Good, I said, rubbing the water out of my thick, wavy, reddish-blonde hair. The same color as my mane when I shifted. Didn't take long to land a few bites. I had a hell of a time earlier, he admitted. It seemed like the pickings were kinda slim. Of course, you had an easier time. What doesn't come easier to you? He grinned good-naturedly. I knew he didn't really mean it, always a fan of busting my balls. Not much, last time I checked. Except making his daddy happy. Cord leaned against the doorframe, his golden eyes narrowing as he smirked. Who told you? Nobody had to tell me. We all know he's on your case, man. He walked through the high-ceilinged living room, his bare feet slapping against the hardwood floor. But now that you mention it, word gets around. Who was listening in? Nobody had to. Everybody in the house could hear it, or so they tell me. He ducked into the fridge, the apartment's open floor plan allowing me to see him from where I stood in the doorway to the master bedroom. He pulled out three beers, tossing one to each of us before opening his own. Even from all the way across the apartment, he reached us, and our sharp reflexes made it possible for us to catch them easily. Well, hell. I took a long drink from my bottle, knowing it was about to be a very long night. I had a lot of partying ahead of me if I was ever going to forget the axe hanging over my head. An axe my father held. What time are you thinking of going out? They both looked to me for answers to questions like that without thinking twice. 10. That's when it usually gets good. Fair enough. Levi turned on my TV while Cord sat on the floor with a controller. Call of Duty, till then? Chapter 2 Jace we made a good picture as we walked into the club. We always did. 
Heads turned when we entered, and approving looks were all I could see. Especially from the ladies. We all had similar builds, tall, muscular. Levi had tattoos up and down his arms, which girls seemed to go nuts over, but they were never really my thing. He shaved his head, too, which completed his image. Cord's unique eyes, well, unique to his entire branch of our family, were what usually drew women to his side. That, and the intensity always simmering just under the surface. There was always a chance something wild would happen when you were with him, and that was a big draw. I always had the feeling girls tried to heal him, or save him, or whatever it was they called it. What a waste of time. What made him different was part of him, like his eye color or his nearly black hair. It couldn't be fixed. Immediately, we were surrounded by friends, acquaintances, strangers who wanted to become less strange. We made our way through the crowd, a big crowd even for a Friday night. I wondered what was up to bring so many people out. Some kind of college thing, Krista, one of the bartenders, explained. A big party for all the schools. Sometimes I wondered what it would have been like to finish college, but it just wasn't for me. I had a clan to lead one day, and everything I had to learn would come from my father. The few business courses I took and actually paid attention to would be enough. Damn, if I knew that, I would have rested up a little more today. Levi winked at Krista, who blushed. I figured she had to see a lot of guys in her line of work, but she always fell for Levi's charm. Most women did. You're young. I think you can handle it. She slid a beer his way, along with one for Cord and me. We'd already pre-gamed back at the apartment while we played video games for a couple of hours, but my buzz was started to wear off. I sucked down half my beer in one long gulp, letting it cool me down. The club was air-conditioned. Everything in Florida had to be air-conditioned in the summer or else run the risk of people dropping from the heat, but the enormous number of bodies moving around made it feel a lot hotter than it normally would. I started wondering if being there was such a great idea. I loved having fun, but screaming to be heard over hundreds of other voices wasn't my idea of a good time. So they all decided to come to the Shifter Club to see if they could have a little dangerous fun. Cord smirked as he scanned the crowd. This happens all the time. I reminded him. Yeah, but now the place is gonna be full of groupies. I nodded, just as unhappy about it as he was. If there was one class of human to avoid at all costs, it was shifter groupies. They were only slightly less dangerous than the collectors and their hunters. A groupie could always be characterized by their slightly insane stare. They were all a little out of it, a little too into the idea of being with a shifter. There were groupie websites, chatrooms who still use chatrooms, blogs, YouTube channels, the works. It was bizarre. And odds were, there were more than a few there. I was just about to suggest we hit up somewhere else when I saw her. She was dancing with three other girls, doing that weird arms in the air, thing girls like to do. I never understood the concept of screaming and waving while dancing. Like, are you in trouble or are you having fun? What gives? But she was having fun. Anybody with eyes could see she was having a great time. Her brilliant smile was contagious, and I found myself smiling the longer I watched her. Her tight, curved, just right body moved like water, flowing effortlessly as she swung her hips from side to side in time with music I could hardly hear over the throbbing of my heart and the racing of my blood. It wasn't usually like that. I didn't normally have 
such a strong physical reaction to a girl the first time I saw her. Any guy knows what it's like to lay eyes on a girl and want her. Bam! Instant boner. Thoughts start going down dark, dirty paths, even while you're trying to impress her and show her what a gentleman you can be. Meanwhile, you're imagining bending her over and taking her from behind like an animal. You're wondering what her tits will feel like in your hands, what they'll taste like, while you're asking her what she does for fun. You're hoping she can't read your mind. Hey, Jonas, a longtime friend, threw an arm around my shoulders. Another lion shifter, like me. I would have thought he could tell I was deep in thought. Sometimes, he could be pretty oblivious. What's up? I ax, still watching the blonde on the dance floor. Her long hair hung down halfway to her waist, in those beachy waves girls were so crazy about. It was pretty, but everybody looked the same. I guessed it was the same way back when Farrah Fawcett and Jennifer Aniston hair was the thing. Why was my mind wandering like that? Why couldn't I take my eyes off her? Uh oh He spotted somebody. Who's the lucky girl tonight? Jonas scanned the crowd, his arm still over my shoulders. Well, it's not that girl standing at eleven o'clock, he murmured, looking at the floor. My eyes moved in her direction. Cute tall big rack. And the intense stare of a total groupie. No. Not that stupid, I muttered back, snorting. I nodded my head in the direction of the blonde. Oh, sweet. Nice choice. Jonas stopped hanging all over me, finally, sitting at the only empty stool at the bar. Maybe the human sensed who we were and gave us space. Sometimes their instincts were as sharp as ours, and something in them must have told them to back away a little. I could finally breathe, even as I felt their eyes on me. Girls and guys, all around my age, trying to make it look like they weren't staring even as they stared. Yes, we were shifters. In the flesh. I almost wanted to jump out and yell boo. Just then, she turned, still dancing. Her eyes swept over the bar, big blue eyes. They locked onto mine, then quickly skittered away. I grinned. She was beautiful. She lit the place up, as far as I was concerned. Like she had a glow all around her, an aura. But it was the way she looked away that reeled me in. It wasn't disgust. Some humans thought we were no good, garbage, freaks. But why would she be at the club if she felt that way? No, it was embarrassment. Shyness. And all it did was make me want her more. She turned back to her girlfriends, and she must have told them to check me out because just like that, three pairs of eyes searched for me. I chuckled. She probably told them to be cool, but they were probably a little drunk. Nobody could play it cool when they were drunk. They approved of me, standing against the bar in my t-shirt and jeans. I might as well have been any of the other humans in the room, just bigger. When I looked around, I could have picked out the shifters even if I didn't know them. They were all at least a head taller, so they stuck out. A few had visible scars, too, along their arms or even faces, thanks to fights out in the swamp or wherever they did their hunting. I didn't have to wonder what the girls thought of me. I could tell from the way they giggled that they hated her, could have clawed her eyes out for getting my attention. But they covered it up with laughter and encouragement. She glanced back at me over one shoulder, her cheeks pink. Was it the dancing or something else? Something a little more primitive in her core. You gonna take that one home tonight? Jonas acts, elbowing me. Why don't you find one of your own and stop narrating my sex life? I ax, elbowing him back. You know me. Already settled down, man. 
just here to blow off some steam. The ring on his left hand gleamed even in the extremely dim light of the bar. So go blow it off, I grinned. He took the hint, wandering away to bother somebody else. A great guy, the best friend I could imagine, but I didn't need him getting up in my game just then. I had to focus on the blonde. Who had disappeared? Damn. I scanned the crowd, surprised at how frantic I was to find her again. What was with me? Chill, man. She can't have gone far. Probably just to the ladies' room, or maybe to sit for a second, even though there was nowhere to sit. She'd been wearing a pretty serious pair of heels, so her feet probably killed. No big deal. I looked over the heads of the other dancers, then around the perimeter of the central dance floor. No go. I spotted her halfway to the door. Damn it. Why was she leaving? There was obviously interest on both sides. Why not come over and talk to me, rather than going outside? Was I supposed to follow her? Was it a game to see if I was on the hook? Well, I was on the hook. I left my beer bottle on the bar and elbowed my way through the crowd. Cord and Levi were out there somewhere, but they wouldn't miss me. We tended to do our own thing when we went out. The air outside the club was heavy with humidity. I could almost see it in the air. What I couldn't see was her. Where had she gone? I'd seen her blonde head disappear out the door only ten seconds earlier, maybe less than that. There were plenty of people hanging around out there, smoking, that sort of thing. My nose wrinkled at the acrid smell of smoke. She didn't strike me as one of them. I walked toward the parking lot, thinking she was actually leaving. I'd follow her if I had to. She'd have done something to me. I needed to know her, even if nothing else came of it. A line of dumpsters sat against the side of the club, just before the drop-off to the parking lot. I heard a weak cry, like a cornered animal. It was soft enough that a human wouldn't hear it, but somebody like me picked it up right away. There she was, at the very end of the row, backed against a filthy dumpster. Her white tank top was smudged with dirt, and her eyes bounced back and forth between the two men looming over her. I didn't think twice. It was a risky move, but I couldn't afford to think about it. I had to act, and fast. The familiar tightening and tensing spread through me as rage unfurled. Then I seemed to swell, to grow and lengthen as I unleashed what was always inside me, just trying to get out. My t-shirt, jeans, everything exploded from my body as I shifted. When the two attackers turned in open-mouthed surprise at the sound of my growl, they were stunned to find a full-grown lion standing in front of them. Chapter 3 Gemma I was on the ground, looking up at the two men who'd shoved me into the shadows as I walked to my car. I crouched there by the filthy, stinking dumpster, terrified. What did they want from me? They were dressed in black, and in the darkness I could only see their eyes. What I saw didn't give me much confidence. They weren't asking me to buy Girl Scout cookies. Please just take my purse. I tossed it between them, watching as it slid along the cracked pavement. One of them chuckled, and they both advanced on me. They didn't even look at my bag. My heart sank even as it pounded out of control. I let out a whimper. Then a louder sound. One which sent a shiver down my spine and made my would-be attackers turn in place, then freeze. The last thing I expected to see just then was a lion, but there it was. A freaking lion. An actual, full-grown lion and it stared the two men down. I was pretty sure I could hear their knees knocking 
as they took in the sheer size of the beast in front of them. I couldn't blame them, I was even more afraid of it than I had been of them. The lion's growl got louder as it took one, then another step in our direction. My attackers fled rather than wait for the third step. I thought that was probably the smart thing to do. Only I was on the ground and didn't have much room to jump to my feet. I tried scrambling away on my hands and knees, but it blocked me. I yelped softly, jumping away. We stared at each other for a beat, then another. Something about its eyes sparked a memory in me. I realized there wasn't a sound coming from the lion, but the in and out of its breathing. No more growling. It had only threatened the two men. Not me. Did lions often roam the downtown area? Then it hit me. A shifter. A shifter had saved me. Thank you, I breathed. I didn't know what else to say. I wasn't used to shifters. That night was my first time at the club. Sure, I knew about them. They didn't hide out the way they'd done for hundreds of years. But I'd never gone out of my way to spend time with them until my girlfriends finally managed to talk me into it. It nodded just once, then the strangest thing started to happen. It shrank before my very eyes. Its mane grew shorter and shorter. Its tail seemed to retract until it disappeared. Skin replaced fur. The face shortened, features swimming until I was looking into a human face. It was him. And he was naked. Oh gosh. I turned my head to the side, my cheeks burning with embarrassment. He was stark naked, not a stitch of clothing in sight. He crouched, palms on the ground, knees pulled up to his chest. It's okay, he said in a low, calming voice. You're naked. Yeah, I kinda know that already. I heard a chuckle under his words. It comes with the territory. Oh, I didn't know that. Silence. Then, do you think you could maybe help me out? Help you? Well, yeah. One good turn and all that. I dared look in his direction again, but I took pains to only look at his face. I wouldn't let my eyes wander any further south. He was right, of course. He had saved me. He didn't have to take such a chance, shifting like that in public. What can I do for you? He looked around, still crouched in place. Do you have a car here? Yeah. Can you give me a ride? I gulped. Give a ride to a naked shifter? I could only imagine what that would look like to the people we drove past. What if the cops saw us? And what the heck would I say to a naked stranger in my car? How uncomfortable would that be? Probably excruciating. It didn't help that I left the club because of him. I told myself at the time that it was because I was tired and had a headache because of the music and people. Really, it was because of the way he looked at me. It made me uncomfortable, but not in a bad way. Not scary. More like something I wasn't used to feeling. An intensity. I couldn't leave him there, naked as the day he was born. Don't you have a car? I had to ax. I came in my cousin's car, but I can't exactly go back in there and ask him to take me home, can I? I mean, I don't usually mind people looking at me, but... No, no. I get it. You're really against this idea, aren't you? In the darkness, I could just make out the curve of his mouth. He was smirking. That got my blood up. I didn't like when people smirked at me especially guys who I already owed a huge debt of gratitude to. I'm not. I'm just. It's been a long night. He nodded. 
I think the first thing you need to do is get up off the ground because it's disgusting. Good thinking. I stood, brushing myself off the best I could. There went my white top. There was grease smeared on the backs of my legs, too. My khaki shorts were probably a loss. Can you look for my wallet, too? He asks. And my keys? They're probably in what's left of my jeans. He lifted one hand to point, and I saw a pile of torn denim. You don't have a choice. I squared my shoulders and walked over to the scraps of the shifter's clothes, amazed at the force he must have shifted with if it meant tearing a pair of jeans to shreds. I found the wallet and keys and kicked the shredded fabric off to the side by the wall. Here you go, I said, tossing them his way. I was still a little unsure about getting too close to him. Thanks. He looked up at a loud noise, and my head turned in that direction as well. A bunch of others leaving the club, laughing and falling over each other. Drunk as anything. They wouldn't remember us, even if they noticed us. I hoped they weren't driving home. We don't have much time, he murmured. It would be better to get out of here fast. Okay. I found my purse, brushed it off, and started for the parking lot. My car was near the back. By the time I'd arrived, it had already been full. I looked both ways as I hurried to my row, afraid those two thugs would come back. I heard the sound of my short, quick breaths as I walked. What was I thinking? Driving a shifter home. I didn't know what he'd do. He might shift again in the car, for all I knew. What if he couldn't control himself? What if he tried the same crap on me those two guys had? Was I completely insane? He didn't know who I was, so he wouldn't be able to find me if I left him. I found my car and jumped inside, locking the doors. I could breathe. Finally, it wouldn't take anything to drive away and never look back, would it? No, it wouldn't. And nobody needed to know what happened. The guy was a shifter. He could take care of himself. Why had I gone to the club in the first place? I was never into shifter culture, the way some of my friends were. They weren't groupies, but they loved hanging out at the club just to be close to the shifters who partied there. It was a turn-on, for sure. Bella and Jamie had already slept with two shifters and said it was incredible. I had no desire to find out for myself whether that was true. The very thought scared me half to death. Just like those guys had. What would they have done if the shifter hadn't rescued me? They weren't going for my purse that much was for sure. They wanted me. I let out a strangled sob when it became clear how close I'd come to something terrible happening. And the only reason it hadn't happened was him. He took a chance and saved me. I couldn't leave him there. I owed him. He was waiting for me. And if he ever found me, after I deserted him, who knew what he'd do then? Darn it. I smacked my hand against the steering wheel, wishing the right thing to do wasn't so scary. I tried to tell myself I wasn't psyching myself out for no reason, but even my best attempts fell flat. I started the car, then fought the urge to take the left turn out of the parking lot and onto the road. Instead, I drove the length of the lot and pulled up as close to where the shifter waited for me as possible. Stay there, I said, jumping out. There was an old beach blanket in my trunk, probably still half full of sand, but it would do. I pulled it out and shook it a few times before running over to where he still crouched in the shadows. Here. This will give you a little dignity. Thanks, he chuckled, wrapping the blanket around his waist. I immediately saw why he did that. He was so big, the blanket wouldn't have covered much if he'd wrapped it around his shoulders. I tried to ignore the dry feeling in my mouth and throat 
when he stood at full height, his broad shoulders and massive arms visible in the moonlight. His chest was almost unreal and his abs sharply defined. I resisted the impulse to reach out and touch him. We should go, I whispered. We had attracted attention. I didn't think he'd appreciate prying eyes or questions. It was a shifter club, but I guessed that didn't mean people walked around shifting all the time. Otherwise, there would be a lot of naked people partying it up in there. He climbed into the front seat. Sure, why not? Sit right beside me in your half-nakedness. Don't slouch down in the back seat or anything. Wouldn't want to make my life easier or anything like that. I got behind the wheel and noticed the way my hands shook. I willed myself to chill out. I didn't want him thinking I was more scared than I was. He might get insulted, and then who knew what might happen. Where to? I ax. I tried to inject a little more confidence into my voice than I actually felt. I'll direct you. It's not far from here. Maybe ten minutes or so. I glanced over in his direction and had to snort at how ridiculous he looked in my car. A very big man in a very little two-door car. His knees were almost around his shoulders. What's so funny, he asks. My friends call this the clown car because it's so tiny but I never really paid attention to how small it was until now. Yeah, it could be a little more comfortable, he agreed. But beggars can't be choosers, can they? Except for his directing me, we made rest of the drive in silence. Chapter 4 Jace She pulled up in front of the building. I waited. What, she asks. Isn't this where you live? Well, yeah, but... But what? Man, she really wasn't going to make things easy for me. I was thinking you could come up. Oh. Not for anything like, you know. I just thought I owed you a drink for the drive. She grinned. I thought I owed you the drive for helping me. Her full lips glistened. I wondered what her lip gloss tasted like. But it was a short drive. So you owe me the pleasure of hanging out for one drink. Just one. Oh my God. She laughed, one hand over her face. This could go on forever, couldn't it? Maybe, yeah. She pursed those lips of hers. I wanted to touch them, taste them, tapping her fingers on the steering wheel. She would give in. If she wasn't going to give in, she would have said no, flat out. She wouldn't be pretending to think it over. Finally, she nodded. Fine. One drink, and even then, it has to be a little drink. I have to drive home. Sure. No problem. As long as I could get her up there. It was all smooth sailing after that. This wasn't my first rodeo. As I got out of the car, I felt her eyes on my back. What? I ax, not turning around. Isn't it a little odd for you to walk in naked? Shoeless. I grinned over my shoulder as we walked through the doors, then into the lobby. You don't spend a lot of time with shifters, do you? Now that you mention it, no. Is that a problem? You don't understand what I'm trying to say. The lobby was empty anyway, and so was the elevator. It didn't matter that I was walking through in nothing but a sandy old beach blanket. So, what are you trying to say then? God, she was innocent. Those wide eyes, staring up at me. She could have been Little Red Riding Hood, following the big bad wolf into his lair. Only I wasn't a wolf. I didn't know any stories about a little girl and a lion. I'm saying you're not used to shifters. She looked at the floor of the elevator car, 
holding one forearm with the other hand. I watched her weight shift from one foot to the other. No, she finally murmured, shaking her head. I'm not. I knew it right away when you didn't give me the secret handshake. There's a handshake. Her head snapped up. Nah. I laughed, and she turned red. Thanks for making fun. Not all of us are used to you guys, is all. I wasn't making fun. I was just kidding with you. There's a difference. The bell rang, signaling that we'd made it to the top floor. The doors opened, and I noticed her hesitating. Come on. I don't bite. I swear. She hung back for another moment before following me down the hall. Thanks for getting these for me, by the way. I held up my keering. Do you always, uh? I looked over at her as I unlocked the door. Always what? Shift out and open like that. I mean your clothes. I opened the door, waving her in. At least we'd cleaned up after ourselves before we left for the club. I never knew if I was going to bring somebody back with me. Girls didn't usually like walking into an apartment that looked more like a frat house. Not very romantic. She looked around, and I could tell she was impressed. Wow, this is huge. Not the only thing that's huge, I thought with a grin. It's a third of the floor, I explained. My cousins have the other two thirds. Wow. I guess you have connections, huh? I mean, if you can afford something like this. From any other girl, that would have come off like she was digging for information. There would have been dollar signs in her eyes. But when she acts, I didn't get that vibe at all. She was just curious. Connections, sure. I smiled. The owner is part of my clan. Your clan? She was still standing by the door, one arm crossed over her body, like in the elevator. Why don't you sit or something? I ax, pointing to the couch. You don't have to stand by the door. Then, I look down at myself. I think I should get dressed, don't you? Yeah. I mean, whatever you think is best. She looked down at herself, too. Are you sure you want me on your furniture? I'm kind of a mess. Hang on. I went to the bathroom, opened the linen closet, and pulled out a bath sheet, which I spread over the couch when I got back to the living room. Here you go. If it makes you feel better. Thanks. I noticed how careful she was to avoid looking at me. It was cute. Let me put some clothes on, so you don't have to keep looking everywhere else but at me. I snickered to myself as I went to the bedroom, then threw on a tee, boxers and jeans. What do you want to drink? I asked from inside my room. You know what? Just water, if that's okay. Not much of a drinker. I walked out into the living room to find her sitting with her hands clasped between her knees. She was so tiny. The kind of woman who could bring out one of two instincts in a creature like me, the urge to consume or the urge to protect. I already knew where I fell. Not really. I don't love it. Not a bad thing. I pulled a bottle of water from the fridge and a beer for myself. So, can I ask you something? Yeah, of course. I could tell she had a million questions. There was so much energy surging through her, it was practically radiating from her body. I was surprised her hair didn't stand on end instead of falling over her shoulders, down her chest. What's your name? I laughed. That wasn't what I was expecting even though it made the most sense. Gjace. Ah, I'm Gemma. It's good to meet you. Thank you for helping me tonight. Her eyes widened 
as I handed her the water. You helped me first. True. So thank you for that. You're welcome. I sat at the other end of the couch, knowing she wouldn't like it if I got too close right away. I was sure she would jump out of her skin when I sat beside her in the car. So, for my next question, I raised an eyebrow. Oh, so there's more. She flushed, looking down at the water. Well, if that's not a problem. No, it's not. I'm just kidding, remember? Yeah, you're a real kidder. So, what is it? I sat back and waited, watching her closely. You said the owner was part of your clan. What's that mean? Like your family. Extended family. We share a bloodline. Does your clan have a name? Used to be Swamp Water. Now it's Everglades. She wrinkled her nose. That's not a pretty name at all, she murmured. I don't think whoever came up with it was going for prettiness, I pointed out. It had to do with our territory. The swamp. Oh. That makes sense. So that's like your place. Right. We hunt there. She shivered, even as she tried to pretend the word didn't bother her. I mean, it's how we eat. No, no, I get it. She looked around, taking a shaky breath. I don't eat humans, if that's what you want to know. I didn't think you did. So, why do I get the feeling you're trying to come up with a reason to leave, right this very minute. I took a drink from my beer and watched her. She was fascinating. I don't sit next to a lie every day. She sounded defensive. You're not sitting next to a lion. You're sitting next to a man who can turn himself into a lion. Are you one of those anti-shifter chicks? Because if you are, you don't need to hang around. She shook her head. I'm not. I just don't know anything. Come on. I can't be your first shifter. You are. Is that so bad? It just doesn't seem likely in this day and age. Well, I'm sheltered. I admit it. We didn't have any shifters where I grew up. None that I knew of. I'm not even originally from Florida. I grew up in Michigan, for God's sake. Michigan. Home of the Lake Dweller Clan. They stretch all the way back to the early 17th century. She stared at me, mouth open. You can't be serious. Sure am. Wolves up in that area, mostly. You probably saw them a bunch of times. Wow. That's a lot to handle. Are you sure you're not messing with me? Completely sure. What about your clan, then? She shifted a little, turning to me. I guessed she was getting more comfortable. How long have they been here? The first of us came over from Spain in the 1400s. That long ago. That long ago. Our history stretches back longer than any other clan, so we're sort of the leaders of the other clans. In Florida. In the country. Wow. Her eyes went round. Are you like a prince or something? I laughed, shaking my head. Not quite. But I'll be leader one day, like my dad is now. Is he a lion, too? I nodded. She looked like she'd already heard more than enough for one night. I liked telling her about it, if only because I'd never met anyone who didn't already know. Maybe I was sheltered. That had to be it. I lived in a bubble of shifters and humans who were close enough with shifters that they already knew what was up. How old are you? Really? Twenty-five. Really, though? 
I heard shifters don't age the same as humans. I'm 25. There was no sense in trying to explain it to her. She was right. We didn't age the same. I'd been wandering around Florida for 70 years, even though I'd only physically aged 25 years. It was too complicated, and there was no point in spending the time laying it out for her when I would never see her again. The idea sent a twinge to my chest. I didn't like the idea of having to say goodbye to her, but she didn't exactly seem to be warming up to the idea of getting friendly. And there I was, thinking I'd be able to get her into bed. She looked around again. This is a really nice place. I like your TV. The 60-inch flat screen was mounted on the wall across from where we sat. Thanks. Would you rather be human? It all came out in one jumble of words, no space in between. Like she forced it out before she could convince herself not to ax. Wow. Ah. Uh, I shrugged. No. I like the way I am. No offense. None taken. I just thought it was worth asking. I don't blame you. We sat there for a long time, looking at each other. I could tell there was so much more she wanted to know, just like there were a million things I wanted to know about her. Everything from her middle name, to her favorite pet, to the first time she fell in love. I wanted her to tell me every single thing there was to know. But that wasn't the kind of thing a man asked a girl to do. Not a girl he'd just met, who looked like she was ready to jump off the couch at any second. Well, I should go now. Sure enough, she stood. But she smiled. Thank you for answering my questions. I didn't mean to come off like some, I don't know, groupie or whatever. Believe me. I've met more than my share of groupies, and you didn't act like them. They're pretty nuts. She smiled. Thanks. And especially thanks for helping me earlier. I know you didn't need to do that. They wouldn't have left me alone if it weren't for you. I can't imagine what might have happened if you didn't show up. Don't even think about it, I advised. You don't need to have that on your mind. You're right, of course. I walked her to the door, barely keeping myself from reaching for her. The lion roared inside me, needing to take what was right there in front of it. I did everything I could to hold back. It was better for her to leave, after all. Thank you, Jace. She giggled tucking a long strand of hair behind her ear before extending her hand to shake. It was such a hopelessly backwards, old-fashioned thing to do. My heart went out to her right then and there. She was really unlike anybody I had ever met before. You're welcome. I would do it again. And again and again, if it meant making sure she was safe. I took her hand, engulfing it, and shook. Then, just like that, she was gone. And everything in the apartment seemed a little less bright. Chapter 5 Gemma My head was in a haze the entire way home. In fact, it wasn't until I pulled into my usual spot beside the door to my second-floor apartment that I realized I'd driven home. I'd operated, totally out of reflex. Sort of scary, that I could make a 15-minute drive without thinking about it. I could only breathe freely after I left his building, feeling like a weight lifted off my chest. The weight of his stare. The weight of knowing I was with a creature I understood nothing about, one that could hurt me if it wanted to. One that had saved me from definite danger earlier. Life wasn't black and white, was it? I got out of the car on shaky legs, still a little freaked out by everything. The thought of what might have happened 
if Jace hadn't come along was almost too much to consider, but I couldn't help remembering the eyes of the men as they leered at me. The thought of a long, hot shower was enough to send me almost running for my front door, where a flight of steps would take me up to my place. Home had never looked so good. A noise in the shadows. A shuffling or a moving noise. I stopped short of the little entryway where my door and the one for my downstairs neighbor sat. I noticed for the first time that the overhead light was out. It wasn't out when I left for the club. I took a step back, away from the darkness, and back into the light from the lampposts dotting the parking lot and the big full moon. My heart raced like a runaway train, and I was pretty sure I'd throw up in another moment or so. A figure stepped out of the darkness. And another. And I knew them both. No. I turned to run, but they were too fast for me. One grabbed my arms, the other clamping a hand over my mouth. I was no match for them, they were too big or I was too small. Either way, I wasn't about to escape. We're not trying to hurt you, the one holding my arms whispered as they dragged me into the entryway. That was n never the idea. Just shut the hell up, stop fighting, and we'll tell you what we really want. My thoughts ran in a thousand directions at once. No way was I about to stop fighting. I knew what they wanted. I knew they were going to hurt me. I kicked, struggled until I was exhausted. Not that it mattered. Those hands never relaxed for a second. We can do it your way if you feel like it, the man snarled. But in the end, you're gonna hear what we have to say. I stopped fighting. I went quiet. Fine. They had something to tell me. I had no choice but to listen. I sure wasn't going to get away. Are you gonna invite us up, or what? I shook my head hard. No way that was about to happen. Have it your way. I felt one of them going through the purse slung over my arm and heard the jingle of my keys. My heart sank, and bile rose in my throat. We don't want to hurt you, for God's sake. That's not what this is about. We're here, so we can work together. Work together? What the hell did that mean? I wasn't sure I wanted to find out, but I didn't think I had a choice. They were going to tell me, whether I wanted to hear it or not. I did believe them, too. That was the thing. If they'd wanted to harm me, they could have done it already. We were alone, in the dark, away from prying eyes. No interruptions this time. Once the door was unlocked and opened, the one holding my arms propelled me up the steps and into the hall leading to the living room. I picked up a snow globe, the heaviest thing I could find nearby, and held it up like a weapon. The two of them held their hands up in surrender. Hold on to that thing if it makes you feel better. The shorter of the two, the one who'd held my arms behind my back until my shoulders screamed in protest, flipped a switch on the wall. I blinked as light filled the room. Nice place, the taller, thinner man said, looking around. He sat on the couch, elbows on his knees. I didn't say you could sit down, I spat. Too late. The second man joined him. They were both still dressed in the black jeans and shirts they'd worn outside the club. We have some things to talk about, and it's better if we're comfortable. I held the snow globe at shoulder height, even though my arms ached from the rough treatment outside. What do you want? Why are you here? Like I said, the shorter man said with a smirk, we have things to talk about. What then? I looked from one of them to the other, poised and ready to fly into a panicked attack if I needed to. We never meant to hurt you earlier. We only wanted to lure the shifter. Lure the shifter? 
You mean? I trailed off. Some instinct telling me not to mention Jace's name. I was in the club, Shorty explained. I saw the two of you spark something. He started following you out. So he texted me, Stretch continued, and trailed you outside. The shifter was too far behind to notice. Too many people. You used me to trap him? I asked stunned. You knew he would come after me? Then why did you run away? We didn't think he'd shift right there in the middle of everything. Shorty shook his head, disappointed. That was a surprise. Yeah, I bet. I thought you were both going to piss yourselves. I'd watch my mouth if I were you, Stretch advised, his eyes narrowed. Just because we didn't come here to hurt you, doesn't mean it won't turn out that way. That scared me into silence. Anyway, Shorty continued, eyeing up his partner, our job was to take him. Not you. To take him. My mind raced, and I went through all the things I'd ever heard about shifters and the world in which they existed. It was like a mirror image of the human world, in a way, much the same, but with a few key differences. Groupies were one of those differences. And? Collectors? Your collectors? Not us, specifically. The man we work for is. So you're hunters? You hunt for money. That's right. Smart girl. Stretch grinned, his pockmarked face lighting up. I can see why he went for you. My stomach turned, but I fought back the disgust his statement unleashed in me. Well, good luck to you. I don't want anything to do with this anymore. Get out of here. It's not that easy, Blondie. Don't call me that. Why isn't it that easy? Shorty smiled. How do you think we knew how to find you? My blood went cold, and the hand holding the snow globe started to shake. I don't know. Yeah, well, we have friends who know how to find things out. The man we work for is one of those people. Listen. Stretch leaned forward, trying to appeal to me. You don't want to mess with this guy. I mean that. Why am I a part of this at all? Follow Jace around if you want to. He's bound to meet another girl soon. Use her. I'm through. What about your sister? I didn't drop my weapon, but my arm fell to my side. The world went a little gray. I could tell from the smug satisfaction on the faces in front of me that they expected me to react like that. What about her? I whispered. What if her bills disappeared? What if she could get that special treatment, and you didn't have to pay for it? I shook my head, backing into the wall. Good thing, because I needed something to hold me up. How do you know about any of that? Like I said, the man we work for has the money it takes to find things out. And he has the money to pay big medical bills. Shorty nodded. He would consider your pal the jewel in his collection. I swallowed over the thick distaste in my throat. His collection. The word was ugly, full of connotations I didn't even want to consider. I couldn't imagine Jace being in a collection. So that's what we need you for. You're gonna help us catch him. No way. You can't make me. But we can make it so your sister lives, can't we? Or the money you'll make can. And isn't that worth more to you than some shifter you didn't even know until tonight? Isn't your sister more important to you? Enough. I dropped the globe, clamping my hands over my ears. I don't want to hear any of this. Get out of my apartment, damn it. They both chuckled. It's cute that you think you even have a choice, Stretch sneered. But you don't, 
so you might as well give up hope of that right now. We know how important your sister is to you, and so does our boss. You'll do what he wants if you want your sister to live. I shook all over, so I wrapped my arms around myself to try to stop. I couldn't. It was pointless. We'll see ourselves out. You have a lot to think about. I won't do it. We'll be in touch. I said, I won't do it. I shook my head as they stood up, turning toward the hall and the stairs leading down and out. Sure. I heard them snickering as they left. I wanted to scream at them, to tell them they were garbage, filth. Jace had more honor and strength in his pinky than they had in their entire bodies. I hated them. I wanted to see them dead. How dare they even touch me? I didn't say a word. I only sank to the floor, my arms still wrapped around me. I couldn't forget Jace's face. His eyes. The way they'd held onto me from across the dance floor. The way I'd recognize them, even when he was in his lion form. Chapter 6 Jace Man, where are you? Ha! Huh. I looked at Levi, who sat beside me on the floor. You totally got your head blown off there, and it's like you walked right into the ambush. And you didn't even react when it happened. Oh, sorry. I put the controller on the floor at my feet. I hadn't been paying even a little bit of attention. My mind had wandered the way it had been wandering for a week. No matter what I was doing, I was thinking of her in the background. And whenever I did something that didn't take too much brain power, like playing Call of Duty with my cousin, she filled my thoughts. What's going on with you? He asks. You've been a basket case for days, man. Have I? I got up to avoid him seeing my face, walking out to the kitchen. You hungry? Always, but that's not what we're talking about right now. I pulled two porterhouse steaks from the fridge, leaving them out on the counter to warm up a little while I got things ready in the kitchen. So, what are we talking about? We're talking about you being so distracted all week long, man. You're not usually like that. I shrugged, my back still to him. If I acted like it wasn't a big deal, maybe he would let it drop. Sometimes I told myself things like that, even when I didn't believe them. I guess I just have a lot on my mind. You know Dad's been coming down hard on me. Yeah, I know all about that. What's the big rush? I shrugged again as I unwrapped the steaks, then salted and peppered them. I wonder if he knows something I don't know. What? Do you mean you think he's sick or something? Or he wants to step down? I'd definitely wondered about that, but I didn't want to make a big deal out of it in front of my cousin. We were close, and I trusted him, but I still didn't want rumors stirring around in the clan. I don't think so. He just loves busting my balls, is all. You know how he is. Yeah, I know. You're not the only one he's tough on. I grinned over my shoulder, remembering some of the times Dad had taken Levi to task for doing something stupid. He only winced, probably remembering the same thing. If he was willing to think about Dad and not about Gemma, I was fine with that. He didn't even know about her. I hadn't told anybody, as far as my cousins knew, I went home alone that night after leaving early. The noise and the crowd were too much for me, I'd said, and it wasn't far from the truth. Hadn't I already been thinking about leaving before I saw her? The cast iron skillet was hot, so I added butter before tossing the steaks in. I didn't need to ask how Levi wanted his. Rare, of course. Same as me. A couple of minutes on one side, 
then the same on the other side. I dropped a piece of butter on top of both after taking them out of the skillet. You make the best steaks, Levi said as he tore into his. But I couldn't enjoy it. I hadn't enjoyed anything for a week. I should have gotten her number. I should have found out her last name. There were so many things I could have done to make sure I'd be able to get in touch with her again. What was it about her that made it impossible to forget? I could still smell her sometimes, the mix of perfume and sweat she'd carried around on her skin and clothes that night. Her shampoo, her soap. Dude, you left again. He snapped his fingers in front of my face. What's going on? And don't tell me again that it's your dad, because I know there's something more than that. I've known you for too long to swallow your bullshit. I wondered if I could tell him and trust him to keep quiet about it. At the very least, I wanted to know that he wouldn't give me shit. And I didn't believe he wouldn't. But he wouldn't let me go without an explanation, either. He was like a dog with a bone when it came to finding out the truth. Maybe it was the sixth sense we all had, or our sharp instincts. Whatever it was, it made him a pain in the ass sometimes. So, are you gonna tell me? I sat back in my chair with a sigh, looking across the small kitchen table to where he sat, waiting. Remember going out last week? Oh uh, yeah. Vaguely. I'm not senile yet. And I left early. Yeah, like a wuss. Right, whatever. I sighed. There was a girl. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I knew there was a reason you left early, and you didn't want to tell me. What, was she sort of a dog? Like were you embarrassed to be seen with her? No. It wasn't like that. I told him the story, the Cliff's Notes version. How I'd gotten there just in time and shifted. How she'd driven me home. But why did you follow her out in the first place, he asks. He would ask that, wouldn't he? I don't know. Honestly, I don't. She was leaving, and I wanted to talk to her. So, I followed her out. A slow, knowing grin spread over his face. I see. You don't see anything. Yeah, I do. I see just fine. Whatever, okay. It's pointless. I don't know how to find her now, since she wasn't totally sold on the whole shifter thing. She was, like, completely unfamiliar with us. She had a million questions. Something crossed his face. He frowned, like he recognized some part of what I was talking about. She didn't know anything about us. Right. Was she there with girlfriends? Like a few of them. I nodded. Yeah, she was dancing with them when I first saw her. He nodded. Was her name Gemma? I sat up straighter. How do you know? He grinned. You already said I don't see anything, so I guess there's nothing I can tell you. So help me, I'll beat the hell out of you right now. Okay, okay. I hooked up with one of her friends that night. She was talking about Gemma, how she left early because she had never hung out with shifters before and wasn't crazy about being there. Do you have the friend's number? Why? Why do you think? He chuckled as he slid his phone from his pocket. Okay. Here. He called the girl, then handed the phone to me. Her name is Bella. Bella picked up. Hey, sexy. I was wondering when I was gonna hear from you. I guess that thing I did with my tongue was worth a call, huh? I bit the side of my fist to keep from laughing. Sorry. This isn't Levi. I looked over at him 
and grimaced. Oh, geez. I'm sorry. That wasn't for anybody else's ears. Clearly, I muttered. Anyway, I'm Levi's cousin, and I hung out with your friend last week. Gemma. Oh, so that was you. She said somebody helped her that night. That was amazing. Thank you for rescuing her like that. It was my pleasure. I racked my brain, trying to come up with something to say that would convince her to give out her friend's number. Then, the obvious lie. Listen, maybe you can help me. She wrote down her number, but I'm an ass. I lost it. I've been meaning to call her all week, too. Do you think you could give it to me? I deliberately kept from looking at Levi as I ax. Sure. I know she'll want to hear from you after what you did for her. I wasn't so sure, but I let her think whatever she needed to think. She recited the number, and I entered it into my phone as I used Levi's. Hey, thanks for that. Levi slashed his hands in front of his throat, signaling that he didn't want to talk to her. Levi's in the shower right now, but I'll let him know you said hi. I hung up before I started laughing. Oh no. What did she say? Something about her tongue. He grinned. Hey, it was worth mentioning. The girl is gifted. I looked down at my phone and Gemma's number programmed into it. She would probably be pissed when I called, but that would just be something I'd have to live with. I needed to talk to her. I needed to be able to reach her somehow. I had never wanted anything so much. Are you sure you're okay, man? I mean that seriously. You've never been like this before. I'm fine. Are you sure? I mean, she's just a human chick. I didn't love hearing him talk about her that way. Yeah, she was just another one of them, but that didn't mean she wasn't worth anything. Shifters mated with humans and other shifters. There weren't any rules. Not that I was thinking about mating with her, of course. I was just reminding myself that it happened sometimes. Humans weren't worthless. He must have seen the look on my face, though, and it must have given me away. Hey, I don't mean it like that. I just meant you've known a lot of girls before, and you never acted this way about them. She must be pretty special, I guess. She's okay. It's just that I don't know. We had a moment. She was in trouble, I helped her, and we had a moment. It was more than just hooking up, you know. I guess that's it. You felt funny about her before that even happened, Levi reminded me. I wished he would keep his mouth shut. I didn't need him reminding me of that. Yeah, well, maybe I knew something. Like I felt she was in trouble. It can happen. He nodded thoughtfully. Yeah, I've heard of that happening, he finally admitted. It was nice when he stopped breaking my balls long enough to be cool. That must have been it, then. Good, he said. For a minute there, I thought you might have found your mate. Nah. I shook my head. No way. I just still have a feeling about her, I guess. Maybe she's not okay. He stood, taking his plate and mine to the sink. We'd pick the bones clean, as always. Then, I guess you'd better call her to make sure she doesn't need your help again. He was kind and smart enough to make sure I couldn't see the smirk on his face when he said it, but I could still hear it. He was wrong about her being my mate. I wasn't ready for that yet. We could be friends, of course. Even shifters had friends of the opposite sex. It was possible. Besides, she was scared to death of me when we were together. I couldn't get within three feet of her, except to shake her hand. 
but I didn't need to be close to her to feel what was obviously between us. I'd been able to feel it when she was on the dance floor and I was across the room. That was why I'd followed her, of course. I could admit that much to myself. Something had pulled me to her. Something I had never felt before. I had never even touched that feeling before. I didn't know it was possible. Maybe it didn't matter if she wanted me to call her or not. Just like it didn't matter if she wanted me to follow her out of the club. It was a good idea then, after all. Chapter 7 Gemma You did what? I almost drove my car off the road when Bella told me who she'd spoken to. I shouldn't have. No, you shouldn't have. My voice echoed throughout my tiny car as I screamed into the Bluetooth headset. Damn it, Bella. Did he hurt you or something? Was he creepy? I heard tears threatening to overflow and felt bad for yelling the way I had. No, no. He didn't hurt me. He wasn't creepy per se. So what's the problem? If you're not creeped out by him and you don't think he'll do anything weird, what's the big deal? I can't explain it. Try me. I mean it. I can't put it into words. Just believe me, okay? It's for the best that I don't want to talk to him. I sighed, wishing I could tell her what happened with those creepy guys. The thought that they'd walked right into my apartment and sat down like they'd owned it still picked at the corners of my mind. It was enough to make me want to replace my sofa. I'd held the story deep inside all week, unable to share my fears and the nagging, gnawing sense of betrayal that gripped me every time I thought about going one way or the other. Either I betrayed Jace or I hurt my sister. Somebody lost out no matter what I did. And why did I care so much about him? It was my sister I should have been concerned with. It was her I should have put my heart and soul behind helping. She was the one I'd known since the day I was born. She was the one who showed me how to braid my doll's hair, how to put on mascara, how to handle myself in social situations. She was the one girl I'd always looked up to. She knew it all. And she was dying, and I could help her if I could only bring myself to betray a stranger I couldn't stop thinking about. I should have checked with you first, Bella admitted. Yeah, probably. But, I mean, you probably know how I felt. Have you ever tried to deny a shift or anything? It's like, impossible. I don't know what you mean, exactly. She sighed heavily. I don't know. It's like they have this way about them. They can convince you to do things because they're so persuasive. Yeah, I guess you have a point. I had felt that way with Jace once or twice. Like when he convinced me to drive him home, or when he talked me into coming up for a drink, which only turned out to be water, but that didn't matter because it wasn't a drink he'd really wanted. He'd wanted me, and he hadn't gotten me. And so, he was looking for me. Him not having my number, and not knowing where I lived, were the only two positives I had to hold on to. If I couldn't get in contact with him again, I could say there was no way for me to trap him. That was all I had going for me, until Bella went and ruined it. I could have strangled her. Hey, you might have a good time, she offered. I rolled my eyes, making a face I was glad she couldn't see through the phone. Yeah, well, that's the last thing on my mind. Jim, are you really okay? I mean, you seem way too shaken up over this. Are you afraid of him? You can tell me the truth. I'll make sure he never hurts you, whatever it takes. I smiled despite my fear. I'm not afraid of him. 
That's not it at all. So what? His clan? That's a different story, I snorted. Of course, I had no intention of ever meeting his clan or being anywhere near them if I could help it. I still wasn't sure about the whole hanging out with shifters thing. Bella did it, and I just didn't see how. How could she forget they were so different? How did she get past the idea of them shifting out of nowhere? Maybe she'd never seen them before. Maybe she had never been crouched on the ground with her back to a dumpster, staring into the eyes of a lion. Just don't answer when he calls, she suggested. Yeah. Good thinking. I'll block his number. I just don't need him in my life right now. Only, I wouldn't block his number. I would answer, because of my sister. Stephanie, I thought, picturing her in my mind's eye. It was all for her. I parked in my spot, in front of my front door. I would never take for granted the safety of my apartment complex again. With my fingers around the can of mace in my purse, I hurried to the front door. The light in the entryway was working again, thank goodness. The apartment was empty. No break-ins. Thank goodness for that, too. I had hardly slept a wink all week, just waiting for my visitors to come back. They'd used my keys the first time, but I didn't put it past them to break in if they had to. I didn't put anything past them. He was going to call me. I had to answer, and I had to pretend to be friendly and light-hearted. I couldn't let him know anything was wrong. And he'd sense it too. I was sure of it. I needed to put thoughts of Stephanie and the collector out of my head. There was a picture of Steph and me on one of the end tables, and it caught my eye as I dropped my bag on the couch. She was so pretty, always the prettiest girl I knew. We looked alike, with the same blonde hair and figure, but she had that certain spark that brought everything together. I'd always felt plain next to her, with her wit and charm. She could wrap anybody around her finger. She was just that beautiful and special. And then she'd stopped eating. It had been maybe a year and a half since I'd first noticed how thin she'd become. Maybe if our parents were still alive, one of them would have noticed before I did. But I was a junior in college at that time, with not much extra bandwidth to worry about my sister. Only when I saw her swimming in her own clothes did I raise alarm. And she'd brushed it off, of course, in her usual way. I'm fine, kid, she'd said. Kid. Even though I was only two years younger than her. I just don't have much of an appetite lately, is all. I'd been sure it was anorexia, and the thought had terrified me. I dragged her to the doctor, who had confirmed that there was something very wrong, just not what I'd guessed. Cancer. She was all I had. Mom and Dad had been gone since I was 16. Just another car crash, in the middle of a long, cold Michigan winter. I'd followed Steph to Florida for college, just to be near her. And I was looking at the possibility of losing her, too. Bills were piling up, and she had no way of paying them since she was too weak to work. There were treatments with a high probability of success, since she was young and had been in excellent health before she got sick. But they were way too expensive, so we'd ruled them out up to that point. I wondered who the collector was, and if they had any idea of how cruel they really were. Dangling the possibility of saving Steph's life in front of me like a big, juicy carrot. Knowing which way I would go, because I loved her so much. I knuckled tears out of my eyes, refusing to give in to tears the way I had so many times over the last week. I was sure my body would dry up and blow away like a dead leaf, since I'd cried out much of the moisture in it. Torn, 
unable to move forward in one direction or another. Loving my sister, but feeling a twinge of something stronger than guilt when I considered betraying Jace. It was like he heard me thinking about him. The phone rang. I hope you're not mad that I called your friend, he began, not even bothering to say hello. This is Jace. I know you called her. She called me. I leaned back against the couch cushions, closing my eyes. If only he were human, just a regular guy. I could be happy that he was so determined to find me. I could feel fluttery and flattered that a hunk like him would go out of his way to get my number. A single tear rolled down my cheek. So you're not mad? No, I'm not mad. You're sure? Positive. I smiled a little at the sound of relief in his voice. Great. So you'll come out with me tonight then. You're assuming an awful lot right now. For one, that I don't have other plans tonight. You can cancel them. You think you're pretty persuasive, don't you? Aren't I though? I mean, tell me the truth. Don't you want to come out with me? The thing was, I did. I really did. Not because of the collector or my sister. I wanted to be with him again, even if he left me feeling unsettled and unsure of myself. I had never felt more safe than I had with him. The fears of him shifting were unfounded, I realized. He wouldn't hurt me. He'd helped me. He'd protected me. And that was what he would keep doing, as long as I gave him the chance. How I knew all that, I had no idea. It all came to be like one big download, from somewhere out in the ether. It took my breath away, the certainty that I had nothing to worry about from him. Instead, I had to worry for his sake. Are you still there? he asks. I imagined him back at his apartment, lounging on his deep, plush couch, watching TV or cooking something up in his chef's kitchen. Wait. Did shifters eat regular food? Do you eat? I blurted out, before clamping a hand over my mouth. Do I eat? Everybody eats. You know what I mean. Regular food? Yeah. Total facepalm moment, right there. Of course. I prefer meat. Nobody would ever mistake me for a vegetarian. But yes, I eat. Why? Are you asking me out to dinner? What? No. No. That wasn't why I ax. I fidgeted, wishing I'd learned how to keep my mouth closed. I have this problem sometimes, where questions fly out of my mouth before I think about them. It's pretty stupid. Something comes into my head, and I start talking. It's not stupid, he said. It's refreshing. You're being nice. I'm usually nice. I grinned. Either way, thanks for not telling me to mind my own business. I wouldn't do that. And I believed him. That was the crazy part. I didn't know him, but I felt like I did. And my instincts told me I was right. So, are you free tonight or what? I would really like to see you. I had no reason to say no even though the stabbing, burning guilt in my gut told me otherwise. I shouldn't say yes. I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I should tell him to forget he ever met me. But I couldn't do that, either. I was still holding my sister's picture in my lap. The two of us smiling, arms slung over each other's shoulders. That was the last Christmas mom and dad were alive. We had no idea then what we were facing in just a couple of months, and then four years down the line. We could afford to be happy, carefree. All right, I murmured, making up my mind. I was doing it for Steph, after all. 8. Jace
I told her to dress up, since I had decided to go all out. She wasn't the kind of girl I could just take to a burger shack and expect to be impressed. There was a lot more to her than that. Class. Grace. Again, how I knew I couldn't have said. But I did know. I knew her. I knocked at her front door, wearing a thin suit of lightweight material that helped me survive the Florida humidity. Sometimes I wished we were part of the New York clan or the Minnesota clan. Florida might have had Disney World and plenty to eat out in the swamps, but otherwise, I could do without the weather. I actually liked snow the few times I'd been exposed to it. Gemma opened the door, and the sight of her took my breath away. She wore a white dress, tight but modest in that it covered her chest and extended down to just above her knee. Still, I couldn't help but stare at her body. She had no idea what she had going for her. No way. Do I look okay? She touched a self-conscious hand to her hair, done up in a high bun. You look better than okay, I murmured, offering her my arm. She reached out slowly, tentatively, before resting her hand on my elbow. It felt so right. How could she not see how right it was for us to be together just then? So do you, she replied, smiling. You look very handsome. Thank you. I led her to my car, parked beside hers. She laughed at the difference in size between the little pink beetle she drove and my black SUV. Wow, she gasped, wiping tears of laughter away from her cheeks. And if that doesn't sum up our differences, I don't know what does. It looks like your car could eat mine. It probably could. There were a couple compact cars missing from my complex a few months ago. I winked as I helped her up into the seat. She had to work hard to get up there, short little thing that she was. I didn't mind watching her ass move under her dress or the way her lean legs flexed as she stepped up. I told myself to cool it. I couldn't exactly throw her to the ground. So, where are we going? she asked when I sat behind the wheel. You'll see. One of my favorite restaurants in the area. Not far from the club, actually. She nodded. I have to admit, I'm not super familiar with the nightlife and restaurants out here. Did you just move here or something? You said you were from Michigan. I pulled out into traffic, pointing the car in the direction of the restaurant. I went to Miami for college and just graduated a couple of months ago, she explained. Hey, congratulations. What did you study? Business and finance. Way to go. I'm sure you've got a bright future ahead of you with that sort of background. We'll see. I'm just a golfer at a firm in town at the moment. Entry level. Exactly. That's the problem with you millennials, I explained with a smirk. You think you can start at the top. Whoa, whoa. Hang on a sec. She shifted in her seat, facing me. Raising one hand, she counted off on her fingers. One, you don't know that that's how I feel. I was only expressing irritation at having to fetch coffee and donuts for my bosses all day. Who would want to do that? Two, it's pretty freaking weird to hear a person who looks to be around my age talking about my generation like they're not part of it. I had to laugh. Sorry, sorry. I guess that's pretty weird for you. You're right it is. She folded her arms, but a quiet snort escaped, so I knew she was only half serious. So I guess you don't get out much. It was a pretty easy conclusion to draw. Who didn't know anything about shifters in that day and age? It seemed ridiculous. We were everywhere. I don't. 
I've always been a bookworm. A homebody. She shrugged. Nothing wrong with that. I didn't say there was. I know you didn't. So there. So there. She laughed. It was good to hear her laugh. If she was laughing, she wasn't afraid of me. For somebody who's been around for 70 years, you're pretty immature. Nobody ever accused me of being mature. I pulled up in front of the restaurant, then hopped out and helped Gemma from the passenger seat. She looked up at the sign when she stepped out, her eyes going wide. Okay, I've heard of this place, she murmured. Yet you don't sound thrilled. She pried her eyes away from the gold-lettered sign above the door. It had a write-up in the paper not long ago. It's pretty fancy, huh? I chuckled. Yeah, you could say that. She looked up again, then through the double doors. I feel like this is too much for just me. Don't say that. There's no such thing. I wondered who'd given her a low opinion of herself. If I could just get my claws on them. I'm a pretty simple person, she reminded me. We don't have a lot of places like this up in Michigan. She shifted her weight from one foot to the other, just like she had when we first met. She was nervous, overwhelmed. That was the last thing I wanted her to feel. If you want, we could always go somewhere else. The whole reason I picked this place was to impress you anyway. She looked up at me, eyes wide. I don't need an expensive dinner. I don't even need you to impress me. I don't? So what? You're already impressed by me. I grinned down at her, watching her blush. I didn't mean it that way, either. Jeez. You're tough. I'll lay off, I promised. I know what you mean. You're just a regular girl. I am. This sort of thing isn't for me. I hope you don't think I'm ungrateful or hard to please. Not at all. It's refreshing. It is. Do you know how many girls I've dated who would love to say they had dinner in the most exclusive restaurant in town? Not to mention enjoying champagne and a bouquet of flowers at the table. Looked like that was a big waste. Still, I would rather know she didn't want those things than go out of my way to give her something she didn't want. Oh, really? And how many girls have you dated, exactly? A lot. Tons. So many. She laughed. Got it. So I'm one in a hundred. Fifty. Twenty. Stop fishing for a number. Fine, fine. But she had a devilish grin on her face, so I knew that wasn't going to be the end of her teasing me. That was all right. I didn't want it to be the end. So, I'm still hungry. Are you? Yeah, I would like to eat. Where do you want to go? Why don't I leave it up to you, since I already struck out? She looked around. There's a cute little food truck park, or whatever you want to call it, on the other side of town. I'm sure you could find something you'd like there. Do you like it? Sure. I work maybe a half mile from there, but I walk up and back almost every day. She giggled. I just made myself sound like an addict, I guess. If it's worth walking every day, it's worth going to now. So we got back into the car, and she directed me to what was once just a parking lot, but had been turned into a sort of pop-up restaurant with a half-dozen food trucks offering everything thing from Cuban sandwiches and croquettes to burgers and fries. I settled for a double burger, rare naturally, and an order of fries. Gemma got a Cuban from one truck and ceviche from another. We staked out a spot on a bench 
and watch the people wandering in and out of the lot. So this is you, huh? This sort of date? Yep. I'm way more comfortable doing something like this. A cheap date. Or you just know who you are and don't need to pretend to be anybody else. I guess you're right about that. You were raised by pretty level-headed people, I bet. I took a huge bite of my burger, leaning over the ground to avoid drippage on my suit. I hadn't exactly expected the night to take the turn it had, not that I wasn't enjoying it, of course. Mom and Dad? Definitely. Dad was a cop. Mom was a teacher. We didn't have a ton of money to spend on things we didn't really, truly need. She picked at her sandwich, looking thoughtful. Past tense. So they were both gone. And she was alone. I forged forward. What made you come to Florida? College? She nodded. And my sister was here. After my parents, you know. I wanted to be with her. You get along well, then. Her face lit up as she nodded. She's the best big sister. I couldn't ask for more. She's older, two years, but she's always been like a second mother in a way. She's super mature, always has her act together. I can only try to be like her. It seems like you have it together to me. If I do, it's all thanks to her. Believe me. I could have gone off the deep end after the accident. She fell silent again. I gave her space to think and just be for a minute. When she spoke, her voice was a whisper. I owe my life to her. I do. She's everything to me. I would like to meet her. For a second there. I would have sworn Gemma forgot I was even there. She jumped a little, startled when I spoke. Oh, sure. Yeah. But you see. She looked away with a sigh, and I got the feeling there was even more to the story. Is this really hard for you to talk about? Because we don't have to talk about family stuff if you don't feel up to it. She shook her head. Her face turned away from mine. I felt waves of grief radiating from her. She's sick. Your sister. A single nod of her head. Cancer. Gemma. Holy shit. I didn't know I was going to stir up so much just by asking a simple question, and I felt like an ass for leading the conversation in that direction. I'm so sorry. I wish there was something I could do. She turned to me. You do? Of course. I wish I could help you. It's not fair for anybody to feel like they're alone in the world. Like everything stacked against them. I'm sorry you're going through it. I didn't mean to be such a downer, she said. Really? I guess this isn't turning into the date you had in mind at all. You wanted a fancy dinner in a nice place without tears. I chuckled as I wiped a tear from her cheek. It's okay. I mean, I usually don't get tears until the second or third date, but why not get it out of the way from the get-go? Her mouth fell open before she started shaking with laughter. You're the worst. So they tell me. That's another one I wasn't expecting yet. Stop it. She swatted at me, laughing harder. You're going to start making me wonder if coming out with you tonight was the best idea. I think we both know it was a pretty good idea. She smiled, then looked down at her food. We sat there like that for hours, talking about life and how many things we had in common. Time flew. It might as well have been a few minutes. Chapter 9 Gemma I didn't ask where he was taking me after our date. 
Had we really sat there for hours? I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw the time on his dashboard and checked my phone to be sure there wasn't a mistake. No, it was really past midnight. There was something happening between us. I could feel it. I was scared of it, admittedly, but it was a delicious sort of thrill. I tried to put thoughts of the hunters out of my mind as we drove back to Jace's apartment. I didn't put up a fuss. I wanted to be there with him. I wanted to be close to him. It might have been the way he treated me when I cried. I never would have expected somebody like him, a shifter, part animal, to be so tender. Even if he had been full human, I wouldn't have expected that. Men weren't supposed to be so sweet, especially with girls they didn't know. There was a charge between us as we walked down the hall. Are your cousins home? No, they're out. If they were home, I'd be worried about them. He winked as he opened the door. So you boys are real party animals, huh? No pun intended. Facepalm. No pun intended. He turned on a single lamp, just barely lighting the room. One button on a sleek remote control, and suddenly the room was full of soft music. So we were getting right down to business. I was still by the door, unsure what to do. He turned to find me standing there, then smiled. Can I ask you a big favor? Sure. Can you come here so I can touch you? His eyes made a slow tour of my body as he spoke. I've been dying to all night. A deep, resounding response moved through me. Who wouldn't want to hear those words? My feet moved without my thinking about it as I walked over to him, my heart pounding harder and harder with every step until it felt like a bass drum in my chest by the time we stood toe to toe. He placed his hands on my arms and my skin seemed to tingle under his touch. I've never kissed you, he whispered. I've wanted to do that, too. You should. I tilted my head back. His hands moved up my arms until they rested on either side of my face. I held my breath, waiting as he came closer. And when he touched his mouth to mine, I sighed. He tasted so good. Desire simmered in my core, spreading out through my arms. I wrapped them around his neck melting against him. I was his. Just that fast. He picked me up like I weighed nothing at all, carrying me to the bedroom. I kicked my shoes off as we went. It was happening. It was really happening. And I wanted it to, so badly. Who was I kidding that I wasn't sure about him, us? I felt like I'd known him my entire life. I couldn't explain it, but there was something so familiar about him. It had scared me at first, it was so strong. I was stretched out on the bed, anxious and desperate to be with him all at once. He took off his jacket, tossing it aside before lowering himself over me. He kissed me again, deeper, slower. I ran my fingers through his thick hair sighing in pleasure as he explored my mouth while his hands explored the rest of me. My legs wrapped around his hips, drawing him closer. He sat up, bringing me with him until I straddled his lap. One hand held me in place while the other unzipped my dress. I raised my arms, allowing him to lift it up and off. He took my breasts in his hands, fondling as his tongue lapped at the skin of my throat, my chest. I reached back to unhook my bra, shedding it quickly to give him better access. It was bliss, and I felt myself slipping away as my body took over for my brain. It knew what to do. I unbuttoned his shirt slowly, eyes peeled to his chest as I revealed it inch by inch. It was like uncovering granite, but a granite I could feel heat coming off of. Granite that flexed and moved. Once I was finished, and the shirt hung open, I took the chance of resting my hands on his shoulders. 
I couldn't breathe. Still, I slid my hands along the rippling muscle of his shoulders, then down his arms until the shirt was off. I couldn't believe my eyes. I'd thought I must have imagined his body looking the way it did, all bulging muscle. I told myself it was all hysteria, just a reaction to coming down from the close call with my would-be attackers and the shock of seeing a shifter change forms in front of me. Nobody looked like that, not anybody in real life. And yet there he was, right there in front of me, and my hands reached for him without my thinking about it. I had to touch. I had to know he was real. He lowered us both to the bed again, and I took my time exploring him, before working at his pants, sliding them over his butt and thighs with my feet. You're beautiful, I whispered, feeling embarrassed as soon as I said it, but it needed to be said. He was gorgeous, glorious, and all mine for the night. Probably only that night, but it was better than nothing. My fingertips danced over his chest, his abs. Just the feeling of all that pulsing muscle and knowing how powerful he was made me even wetter than before, knowing he could do anything he wanted to me and I couldn't stop him. It was so hot and my entire body responded. I ground my hips against him, feeling his hardness pressing against my aching mound. I thought my heart might explode. Come here, I whispered, pulling him closer. He tasted just as good as he looked, salty and musky. I dragged my tongue over his shoulder, biting gently as he kissed my neck. It was so good, too good. Better than I had ever imagined, even in my wildest fantasies. In my fantasies, the man in my arms wasn't the man he was. Wild, overpowering me. Setting something loose inside me that I had never felt before. He took me, almost gently, driving his covered manhood into my sex. I dragged my nails over his broad back as a groan filled the air, my groan of desperation. I wanted more, more. He was a, like a drug I already couldn't get enough of. My body was primed for him. I slipped one hand down between us to show him what I wanted. I took him in my hand, and when he threw his head back and growled in response. That growl seemed to shoot straight between my legs. I shuddered as I started stroking him through his shorts. He was hard, thick, almost too thick for me to get my fingers around. There was a feeling of power in holding him like that, bringing him pleasure. I flicked my tongue over his lips as he trembled above me, completely at my mercy. I feared for a second that I wouldn't be able to take him inside me, but at the same time I knew I wanted to try. I wanted to feel him all through me. He grunted, his hips moving as he couldn't help driving himself through my grip. He bent his head, kissing me, his breath coming faster and faster as his hips moved. Our mouths crashed together, tongues dancing, breath mingling the way our groans of pleasure did. Can't keep that going, he finally chuckled in chagrin, pulling himself out of my grip. We'll see how much you like it. Before I could ask what he meant, he hooked his thumb under the elastic of my panties. I gasped, freezing for a second. He stopped, looking down at me with concern. You all right, he whispered. Yes. Fine. Sorry, it's just. We don't have to go any further. I heard the strain in his voice, even at a whisper. I knew he meant it. He'd stop. He just wouldn't like it very much, but he would if he had to. That, almost more than the deep throbbing in my core, made me want to go further. I want to. I pulled his face to mine, kissing him deeply to cement my words. I wanted all of him. It was just a little scary, was all. But in bed, half-naked and painfully aroused, wasn't the time to talk about that. I didn't know what he'd be like, not being completely human and all. Even with all that, 
I trusted him. He wouldn't hurt me. And it wasn't like I was the first human he'd ever hooked up with. So as he worked the panties down to my ankles, I held my breath but didn't stop him again. He was tender, gentle as he ran a hand up the outside of my leg until he reached my thigh. It was delicious, the way he touched me. I opened my thighs to him, inviting him to do more. He growled deep and low, his face close to mine as his hand found me. I gasped, driving my hips upward, desperate for relief, and his growl turned into a chuckle. Greedy, he whispered with a wicked grin. I closed my eyes, turning my head from side to side, as he stroked my mound without dipping any further inside. Didn't he know I would die if he didn't? Do you want me to touch you? He whispered, his fingers gliding over my moist lips. Yes, please, I begged. Please, Jace. I need you. I looked up at him, pleading, practically near tears. He smiled, satisfied, and sank his fingers into my folds. I cried out, clinging to him, as fireworks exploded behind my eyelids. He worked my throbbing flesh, stroking me, until I was in a frenzy and everything came to a single, shining peak. I felt my body go rigid all over for that last, heart-stopping second before dissolving into shivering bliss. When I came to, he was fumbling around in his nightstand. I waited with bated breath, while he unrolled a condom over what I'd only felt through his clothing before then. He was long, as thick as I imagined. I bit my lip, wondering again if I could take him. He was so much bigger than me. He noticed my face. I'm gonna ask again. Are you okay? Please? I held my arms out to him, inviting him in. My heart took off at a gallop when I felt the pressure between my legs at my entrance. Pleasure started building again, a deeper burn than before. I'm going to try to control myself, he muttered through clenched teeth. I kissed him to show I understood, before he drove himself into me, and everything else disappeared, as a brief flash of pain dissolved into total delight. I started coming again at the first thrust, and he grunted in my ear as I clenched even tighter around him. So good. I whispered, breathless with pleasure. He moved in slow, measured thrusts, smooth and deep. I rolled my head from side to side, half insane as my body shuddered again and again. I didn't think I could take any more, but he kept going, faster, harder. He was losing control, and I was there with him. I knew what abandon was for the first time. You're mine, he growled, and I dragged my nails down his back in response. I was. I was his. I grunted like an animal as he took me, riding me, his muscles working beneath the skin, beneath my hands. I urged him on, gripping him tighter with my legs, pulling him inside. Our bodies slapped together, faster, faster. Our cries mingled, filling the room with sound. Come for me he commanded as he thrusted, pounding his length into me. Let me feel you come again. I thrusted my hips up to meet his downward thrusts, taking what I wanted, moving closer and closer. It didn't take long for that familiar pressure to build up inside my core, tightening until it exploded. Yes? I screamed, letting it all out for once, not caring if anybody else heard me. I had to scream, I had to tell him how incredible it was. Yes, Jace. Yes. A roar filled the room as he threw back his head and gave voice to his own orgasm. Instead of terrifying me, as it would have otherwise, I felt deep satisfaction and pride that I'd brought him pleasure. It felt right. Real. Primal. He collapsed a little rolling away before his weight crushed me. As the thrill passed, and I came back to myself, I felt totally wiped out. A steady throbbing made itself known between my legs, not painful at all, 
but a reminder of how hard he'd taken me. And I'd loved it. I fell asleep before I knew it, too exhausted to speak or even thank him. Chapter 10 Gemma Well, this was new. When I opened my eyes, I was still in Jace's bed. Fear gripped my heart. Maybe I wasn't supposed to spend the night. What if he woke up and kicked me out? What if he thought I was too clingy or that I'd overstepped my boundaries? What a boneheaded move. I should have asked if he wanted me to go. I would have gone if he'd wanted me to. I didn't want him to think I was weird. Wait a sec. Why are you freaking out so much? Yesterday at this time, you were anti-shifter. Now you're fangirling and crushing and flipping out because you think he might not like you. I had to acknowledge the truth of the voice in my head, while hoping I wasn't the only person in the world who heard a voice of reason telling them what to do from time to time. That didn't make me crazy, did it? I hoped not. That voice sounded a lot like my sister, since she was my real-life advice guru. What would I do without her? My heart clenched, and I curled up in a ball at the thought of Steph and the connection to Jace. What was I doing there? What was wrong with me? I shouldn't have slept with him. I should have gone home and been done with it. Why get even closer to him? and feel even worse about what I was leading him into. He'd never forgive me. He'd think I had only slept with him to get him to trust me. I could only hope he'd remember what I told him about Steph, how much I loved her, how she was all I had. Maybe he could forgive me one day if he knew I did it for what I thought was the right reason. I didn't have a choice. I had to help my sister more than I had to protect him. I was on my side, facing away from him, and I clamped my hands over my mouth to muffle the sounds of my tears. He slept like the dead, sprawled out on his back and snoring lightly. He didn't skip a beat, the entire time I cried my heart out, only a foot away from him. By the time he woke up, I was washing my face in the bathroom and swishing mouthwash. Good morning, he called out. Oh, you're up all already? I spat out the mouthwash, leaning over to see him through the doorway. Oh, he was beautiful. The stuff of dirty fantasies. The sheets just barely covered him from his hips down, concealing his big, thick member while giving me a good look at his chest, abs, that sexy V cut into the muscles below his waist. Like a treasure map, leading to the goodies. I'm out of bed, obviously. He rolled his eyes. I didn't mean it that way. I mean like, out of bed for good. Oh. I leaned against the doorframe. Do you want me to be? Should I come back? You don't have to work so hard to do what you think is right, you know. What's that mean? Just do what you want. So what if I wanted you to come back to bed? And for the record, I sorta did. I sorta still do. He looked me up and down, grinning wickedly as he did. I'd only worn my bra and panties to the bathroom since I had nothing else with me. I was intensely aware of my level of undress just then. His eyes raked over my body, and it was pretty clear that he liked what he saw. I licked my lips, still a little unsure of myself. I'd already cried a river when I thought about how I was possibly betraying him. I couldn't twist the knife even more. Actually, I... Don't say another word. He rolled onto his back, sighing. A girl doesn't start off with the word, actually, unless it's bad news. I was just going to mention having things to do this morning. I have a brunch date with my friends. So it's bad news. You're not sticking around. He pouted. 
He legitimately pouted. It was the cutest thing I'd ever seen, but I had to stay strong. I'm sorry. It's sort of a long-standing thing. I made it a point to keep my eyes away from his body as I dressed. Since I was afraid if I kept looking at him, I'd lose all willpower. Who wouldn't? He had a body made for all sorts of sins. And there was no forgetting what he had done to me. I hadn't known pleasure like that was possible until he showed me. I could feel him watching me. I felt sexy, desirable, and like a miserable liar all at once. Not a comfortable combination. Can I call you later, he asks. See? I ask this time. I smirked over my shoulder as I zipped my dress. Like you wouldn't call if you felt like it, no matter what I said. That's not true. Please. That is so true. I can tell you like to get what you want. I wanted you, didn't I? The breath caught in my throat, and I turned slowly. You did. I hope you weren't disappointed. How could you even think that? I mean, you were here, right? You know what happened. My cheeks burned almost painfully, but I forced myself to hold his gaze. I had that same funny feeling that I had when we first saw each other at the club. Something inside was pulling me to him. Something in my core. Something I could deny or ignore. Like he was a magnet, drawing me in. I blinked, and the feeling subsided a little. I finally knew how a fish felt when it got hooked, and I didn't think I enjoyed it very much. I'm glad. I found my shoes just outside the bedroom door and slid them on. You're really in a hurry. Like I said. Plans. Right, right. Damn it, I was being weird. It was so obvious. He would sense it. Well, if he pressed me, I could just act like I wasn't used to one-night stands, which I wasn't. I rarely woke up in a strange bed. Maybe once before then, twice at the most. It wasn't my thing. He got out of bed then, leaving the sheets behind. Oh, Lord. I swallowed hard, my core tightening reflexively at the first look at his glorious body. It wasn't even fair. He was like a living god. I would expect to see a body like his, carved out of marble in a museum. I'll walk you out, he offered. I noticed he didn't bother reaching for anything to cover up with. Um, haven't you forgotten something? I won't look down, I won't look down, I won't, oh crap I look down. Exactly what have I forgotten? You're loving this, aren't you? More than you know, he grinned. Who's gonna see me? My cousins. What if they brought girls home with them, and the girls are walking by? He shrugged. So, let them get a look at what they could have had if they hadn't settled for second best. I giggled. You're terrible. And truthful. He put an arm around my waist as we walked to the door. And truthfully, I'm glad we had a night together. And truthfully, I hope we can do that again. You do. I turned to him before he opened the door, nearly craning my neck to look him in the eye. Boy, was he tall. Yeah. I had a great time. You're easy to be with. I was overwhelmed. I had nothing to say to that. I felt like I should apologize, but there was no way to. Instead, I replied, and so are you. I had a really good time. So, we can get together again? Why don't you give me a call, and we'll figure something out? He bent to let me kiss him on the cheek, then took me by surprise when he took my face in his hands and turned it so our lips met. I melted a little, my knees going weak as he probed my lips, then the inside of my mouth with his tongue. I wanted to give myself 
over to him again. It would have been so easy to slide out of my clothes and let him take me anywhere, everywhere he wanted. The blood surging between my thighs, pulsing, burning, drove me to moan into his mouth. I was so close to begging for him. But no. It couldn't be, not until I figured something out with the hunters. Phew, I breathed when he finally let me come up for air. That was something. I thought I'd give you something to remember me by. I walked out on shaky legs. I'll do more than remember you, I giggled. Good. He watched me walk down the hall, I felt his eyes on me, and only when I was inside the elevator did I feel like I could relax for a minute. Holy heck. He was almost too much to resist. Talk about a close call. I was still smiling to myself when I got back to my apartment, remembering that kiss and everything that had happened before it. He wanted me. Him. He wanted plain old me. Little Miss Innocent, at least for the first time. He thought I was beautiful and funny and desirable. It was incredible. When I reached my front door and saw it standing slightly ajar, my smile dissolved and terror unfurled in my stomach. Oh no. Not again. And this time, they'd broke in. Oh, you're home. Shorty threw open the door, pulling me through before I could so much as cry out. What are you doing here? I whispered as he closed, then locked the door behind us. I want you out, now. This is too damn much. Go. Honey, we've been waiting here for you all night. I think you owe us a meeting, after all this wasted time. They'd been waiting. My mind buzzed as I walked up the stairs, noting Stretch's presence on my couch. His eyes were closed, hands folded on his thin chest, but every muscle in his body was tense, like he was ready to spring up at any moment. I couldn't let either of them trick me into letting my guard down. Explain to me why you're here and why you'd wait all night for me. This is ridiculous. I pushed Stretch's feet off the couch, too angry and scared half out of my wits to care about avoiding getting them worked up. I was already worked up enough. Well, Stretch explained with a yawn, we wanted to talk to you, since it had been a week since we first met and all. Figured that was enough time for you to think things out. And? And we followed you two to that restaurant, and the food trucks. And then, Shorty added, with a lascivious grin, I wanted nothing more than to slap off his face. He sat beside his partner, leering at me. That's none of your business, I said, crossing my arms. I felt so dirty, and so unable to keep myself from them. They'd followed me. They'd spied on me. They knew we were together. How come you didn't tell us you were going out with him last night. Stretch acts. I didn't even know how to get in touch with you, I said, totally reasonably. He threw a dirty look in Shorty's direction. Oh shit. I was supposed to leave a number for you to call us. I rolled my eyes as Stretch smacked him in the back of the head. It doesn't matter, I continued coldly, glaring at them as hard as I could to cover up the fear darting through me. I wouldn't have called you, anyway. No way. You've picked the wrong girl. Shorty shook his head, looking sad. Oh, honey. That's the wrong answer. So you've already said, but that doesn't change how I feel. I'm out of this. I was never in it to begin with you. Pick somebody else. Oh hell no. He's stuck on you, sweetie. Stretch looked me up and down, just as nastily as his buddy had. And I can understand why. Don't talk like that, I warned. I can call the cops at any time, by the way. You broke in last night. And wore gloves the whole time. 
the both, showed me their gloved hands. Still, you're trying to get me to do something I know has to be illegal. Kidnapping, at the very least. You don't even know our names, who we work for. Stretch glared at Shorty. And you don't have a number where you can contact us either, thanks to my partner here. You don't have a single way to identify us. So no, that's off the table. Try again. I searched my mind wildly, knowing in my heart of hearts how right he was. I had nothing. I'm not going through with this, I said again. I'm out. I don't care what you have to do to replace me. You'll find somebody else once I tell him I can't see him anymore. The more time I spend with him, the more danger I put him in. I won't do that to him. Especially not after today. Stretch shook his head. I love that you think you have a choice in all this. Just like that, quick as a flash, he was off the couch and in my face, shoving me up against the wall so hard my head bounced off. I cried out in surprise, fear and pain. He pressed my shoulders to the wall with one arm over my chest. Here's how it's gonna be, he snarled, and his breath was hot sour. I turned my head away, but there was no avoiding him. It was enough to make me gag. You're gonna do what our boss says, or it ain't gonna be pretty. What's that mean? I whispered, clenching every muscle from the waist down to keep from peeing myself in pure fear. It means it's not just your fuck buddy who's gonna be in trouble pretty soon. We were willing to work with you up to this point. But now, if you don't do as we say, your sister isn't gonna be the biggest problem in your life. He half grinned, half snarled. Maybe the two of you can get a hospital room together. Get away from me, I growled. You're not calling the shots here. When are you gonna finally figure that out? You're not in charge. He pressed his arm more firmly into me for a few excruciating seconds before letting go. I felt dizzy, like the world was graying out on me. Digging my nails into my palms helped bring me back. No way would I pass out in front of them. I couldn't trust what they'd do if I did. Leave. I glared at the two of them, standing in the middle of my living room. You just remember what I said. Stretch left a card with a hastily scrawled phone number on it. It's untraceable, so don't bother telling the cops. Give us a call when you're ready to do what we want. I heard their footsteps pounding down the stairs, heard the door open and shut. Only when I heard a car engine fade into the distance did I move. My first stop was the bathroom, where I vomited up all the fear and horror coursing through me. But it wasn't enough. Nothing would take the feeling away. Maybe the two of you could get a hospital room together. I shuddered, then curled up in the corner on the cold, unforgiving tile with my arms around my legs, holding them to my chest. What was I supposed to do? Chapter 11 Jace It was early on Tuesday morning when Dad called me into his office to talk about something he said was of the gravest importance. Normally, if he called before dawn, I would have rolled my eyes and gone back to sleep. But he wasn't the sort of guy to get lost in hyperbole. If he said it, he meant it. There was something grave going on. I found out when I arrived and went straight to his office that it was worse than anything I had imagined. Two guards stood on either side of his door, nodding as I walked past. Dad was on the phone, talking in a low, strained tone. He held up one finger as I entered, then turned away as he finished his conversation. I watched him, wondering what it was like to have the entire clan, not to mention most of the major decisions of the rest of the country's clans, on his shoulders. That would be me one day.
was I ready for it? No. I wasn't ashamed to admit that I was nowhere near where I needed to be to lead the clan the way Dad did. To a shifter, being around for seventy years was nothing. Dad was more than twice my age. He was better suited to lead than I was. I hoped he had plenty of time left on Earth, since I had a lot to learn before my time came. When he hung up, he looked more troubled than I could remember seeing him since right after my mother died. What is it? I ax, getting right to the point. I sat in one of the chairs across from his high-backed leather monstrosity. His normally smooth forehead was lined with worry. One of my contacts delivered some very disturbing news late last night. About whom? His eyes locked with mine. You. Me. Why me? What did I do? I ran through a list of potential offenses in my head. Partying too much, drinking too much beer, hanging around, and not doing anything with my life. You didn't do anything. It's not something you did, it's something that might be done to you. I leaned in. What? He pressed his thin lips together, like he was deciding whether it was a good idea to tell me what he had to tell. Dad, please, don't withhold this from me. If it has to do with me, I deserve to know. You're right, of course. He sighed deeply, shaking his head. I've received word of a collector on the hunt for you. For me. I pointed to myself, one finger touching my chest. Yes, for you. Why me? Why do you think? You're my son. You'll be in my place before long. You're a great catch for whoever they are. I assume this is a man, since most collectors are, but I know nothing about them yet. He folded his large, powerful hands on the top of his desk. I know nothing about them, and it's driving me insane. Dad, don't be so hard on yourself. How can I not? What if you were out somewhere last night and the hunters pounced on you? Then I would have shifted and pounced on them, I said, meaning every word. Don't forget how easily scared off some of these so-called hunters are. They're a lot of talk, a lot of bluster, but when they're in front of one of us for real, it's a different story. I know, he agreed, but there's no telling how many hunters are involved or exactly how they're trying to get to you. Although, he trailed off, looking at me from under lowered brows. Go on, I prompted. He stood, hands clasped behind his back. I watched as he began to pace in front of a wall covered from floor to ceiling in rows of books. He always liked to be well-read. Do you have anyone new in your life? I paused. Anyone new? Gemma's face flashed in front of my eyes, but I blanked that thought out. I didn't want him to know about her. I couldn't explain why it seemed like a big deal to keep her a secret, but... I had the feeling, just then, that revealing the new human girl i just slept with days earlier wouldn't be a good idea. You know me, I said with a smirk I wished I felt. I always have someone new in my life. You know what I mean, Jace. This isn't a joke. I shrugged it off, playing insolent, hoping he wouldn't see through me. Why do you even ax? I mean, yeah, I meet girls and hook up with them on the regular. I'm not going to apologize for that. He sighed again. He might as well have the sound recorded so he could play it whenever he felt the need to remind me what a disappointment I was to him. Nobody's asking you to apologize, Jace. The reason I ask is because the rumor involves a human girl the collector is using to trap you. The news hit me like a ton of bricks, even though I should have felt it coming. Of course, that was what he was leading up to. 
There was a spy in my life, someone working for a collector, trying to lure me the way Delilah lured Samson. Gemma. It had to be Gemma. She was the only girl who played even close to a major role in my life just then. We hadn't spoken since Saturday morning, mainly because she hadn't answered her phone when I called, but she was always on my mind. I couldn't forget the way she felt, tasted, smelled. It was all fresh, like she'd just left my bed moments earlier. Did she have it in her? Was she really that cold? I couldn't bring myself to believe it, but she was the only girl. The only one who mattered anything to me. Definitely the only one I'd ever made a point of seeing twice. I'd never believed in getting myself tied down when there was no chance of a relationship. Dad was ominously silent as I took it all in. When he spoke, his voice was steely. Let's go over this again. Is there anyone new in your life? There was a girl, I admitted, but she's nothing. I haven't seen her in days. And now that I know, I can course correct. Not a big deal. You're sure about that? His eyes narrowed. Because I don't think this is the sort of situation that warrants sitting still and doing nothing. Oh. And what do you think the situation warrants? An attack. On whom? I didn't mean to nearly shout it, but the words came out at a pretty loud volume nonetheless. Who do you think? The girl. Why would we attack her? A fear tactic, of course. She can tell us who she's working with. What happens to her after that is none of my concern or yours, he added as an afterthought, cutting off any chance I had of protesting. I don't think the situation really calls for that, Dad. I stood, reminding him that I wasn't a kid anymore. I was taller than him, broader, stronger. I knew my way around the world, too. She's weak. Small. Easily scared. It's not worth it. If we're going to stage an attack, it should be on the collector. I agree with that. But if you bring Hellfire to her front door, she'll shut down. I'm sure of it. What makes you so sure? You sound like you know her a lot better than you made it sound a minute ago. She's easy to read. I didn't have to try hard to tap into her emotions. She's pure. Clean. And if a collector roped her somehow, there's got to be a good reason for it. His green eyes glinted. Are you sure you're not just telling yourself this because you can't believe a woman would betray you this way? Don't even joke about that. I'm not joking, he said, shaking his head in what looked like disgust. You can't handle the thought of a woman doing something like this to you, so you insist she's got a good reason. I hope you understand how weak you sound right now. He shook his head again, his collar-length golden hair shaking in time. That's not fair. I know this girl. You've never even met her. I think I'm a better judge of character than you are right now. Meanwhile, I've seen situations like this with collectors more times than I can possibly count. I think I'm a better judge than you are. We faced off like that, staring at each other at a crossroads where neither of us was willing to budge. I backed down first. Just, please, promise me something. Don't send anybody over to talk to her yet. If you scare her, it might be the biggest mistake you could make. She didn't even know anything about shifters before we met. And you believe that, he acts, scoffing. You're more gullible than I thought. I would appreciate it if you laid off the insults. You're laying them on pretty thick for this early in the morning. He seemed to shake himself, then I watched him deflate before my very eyes. 
Suddenly, he looked very tired. I wouldn't know what time of the morning it is since I never went to bed. Dad, you have to take care of yourself. You can't pull all-nighters like this. Don't tell me what I can and can't do. This is what a leader does, especially when his son's life is involved. He stays up all night, night after night if necessary, until he knows the people he loves are taken care of. With that, he went back to his desk and downed half a cup of coffee. One of his biggest vices. Under the circumstances, I think it would be best if you stayed here until things are smoothed over. What? No, Dad. Come on. I can take care of myself against a couple of hunters. His eyes blazed. I've never told you what some collectors do to their collections, have I? That surprised me. I felt myself shying away from his eyes. They were so intense. No, you haven't. I didn't think any of us knew. Yes, well, we do. He leaned back, lacing his fingers behind his head. There are zoos where the captives are forced to shift at the will of their captors, or of the people brought in to take a look and admire. How can a shifter be forced? Oh, let's see. Burning. Cattle prods. Tasers. I get your point. He nodded, satisfied at what I was sure was a green tinge to my cheeks. Then there are the collectors who kill, stuff, and display their prizes. Do you like the idea of being an exhibit, like in some museum? Of course not. There are collectors who starve their collections, who perform medical experiments, who force their collections to crossbreed to see what comes out of it. He closed his eyes for a moment, then opened them. And that's just what I know about. I'm sure there's much more I've never been informed of. How do you know all of this? And why did you never tell me? He smiled in exhaustion. It's what a leader does. There are many things I've never told you, or any of the others in the clan. It's the weight on my shoulders at all times. And now, I'm trying to keep you safe until we shut down this threat. Do you understand why it's so important to me that you stay here? I didn't want to agree with him, but I had no choice. He had a point, even though I didn't like to admit it. I'll go up to my room, I muttered, reminding myself not to throw a hissy fit like a child. He would love it if I did that. Amazing how I still felt like a kid sometimes, and how he still treated me like one. Talk about a chicken and egg situation. Did I act the way I did because of the way he treated me, or was it the other way around? I jogged upstairs in plain sight of the guards at the office door, then headed to my room. But I wasn't going there to sleep or rest. I was going to climb out the window and go to Gemma. I still had her address programmed into my phone's navigation app. All I had to do was follow it to get to her before Dad and his men did. I could only imagine how terrified she would be if they showed up. I didn't want to believe she deliberately seduced me, even though the evidence piled up in favor of her doing just that. She didn't have the guile. She was too innocent. Or was she? Was Dad right? Did I only see what I wanted to see? Only one way to find out. I opened the French doors of the room I'd slept in until I moved into the apartment, expertly climbing over the railing of the balcony just outside the bedroom and swinging out onto the grass below. I landed with a soft thud, keeping my legs loose so I landed in a crouch. Nobody noticed me. The windows were dark except for the ones behind Dad's desk. I crouched, running beneath them, then bolted for my car. Chapter 12 Gemma
The sound of my phone ringing woke me from what was already a broken, nightmare-filled sleep. I hadn't slept well since Saturday, no, since before then. Since the night I met Jace. The only time I'd slept half-decently since then was the night I'd spent in his bed. I'd felt safe then. But only then. Every little noise made me jump. I was afraid to fall into a deep sleep. What if I woke up and the hunters were there, deciding to make me pay for not delivering their boss's prize? To make things worse, it was Jay's calling. What could he want? Through sleep-blurred vision, I saw it was barely seven in the morning. Hello? I sat up, rubbing my eyes. I was so tired, I could cry. I could have easily burst into tears, right then and there. It felt like I'd die if I didn't get sleep, and right away. Where are you? In my room. Where do you think? Where are you? Outside. Let me in, please. What? I stumbled out of bed, then out into the hall. What are you doing here? I didn't wait for him to answer. I was already halfway down the stairs before my question was out. I'll tell you when I get inside. It's important that you let me in right now. All right. I'm coming. I unlocked the door and opened it. The look in his eyes made me wish I hadn't. He pushed his way into the apartment, making me cower against the wall opposite the door. After checking the locks to make sure they worked, he turned to me. What's really happening here? What do you mean? I rubbed my eyes, still groggy. Always groggy. Sometimes I felt like I was living in a dream, just floating from one thing to another. Reality didn't feel real anymore. Was I going crazy? Are you working for a collector or not? Tell me the truth, Gemma. My mouth fell open. How do you know? He closed his eyes, leaning against the door as if for support. Wow. Not the answer I was hoping for. Come upstairs. Tell me now. Please, Jace. If I don't get some coffee right now, I'm going to fall apart. But instead of walking upstairs, I sat down with my head in my hands and burst into gusty sobs. Heartbroken sobs. I couldn't have moved another inch if there was a million bucks on the line. I could tell he didn't know what to do, but that didn't matter to me just then. All that mattered was that I was exhausted and terrified, just waiting for somebody to come and hurt me. You look thin, he said, his voice sort of cold and distant. I can't eat. I can't sleep. I ran the back of my hand across my nose. Disgusting, but I didn't have any tissues on me. I'm falling apart, Jace. I don't know what to do. It's that bad, he asks. Was he relieved? I thought he sounded that way. Why? He was a mystery to me. I was just about to ask how he knew what had happened when he scooped me up in his arms and carried me up the stairs. I rested my head against his chest as we climbed. It felt so good. I was so, so tired. I didn't know anything but how tired I was and how right it felt to be in his arms. I felt safe again. Finally. He sat me on the couch, then went to the kitchen. I heard him fixing a cup of coffee using my pod coffee maker, and minutes later, there was a steaming cup in my hands. Thank you, I whispered drinking deep. The coffee didn't react well with my empty stomach, but at least I felt a little more alert. Tell me. What's happening? Who is this collector? I shook my head. I don't know. I've never met them. Only the guys who are doing the hunting. I dared look into his eyes, and the fury in them scared me like I'd never felt scared before. 
even more than I'd been when Stretch pinned me to the wall. You're not going to like this, but it was the two who tried to mug me that night. So the three of you are working together? He got up and put his fist through a wall. I screamed a little, curling up on the couch to protect myself. No, it's not like that. They trapped me. What's that mean? They picked me out, because one of them was watching us in the club. They lured you using me, but I didn't know that was what they were doing. I didn't know until I got home that night, and they were waiting outside for me. Their boss, I really don't know who it is, found out who I was and where I lived. And they told me I had to help them lure you again. And that's why you went out with me on Friday? No. I never told them I was going out with you, Chase. Because I had no intention of working with them. I let out a strangled sob, remembering the way they'd threatened me. I still don't want to work with them. One tear after another dripped down my cheeks, landing on the tank top I wore to bed. So why are you such a mess then? I don't get it. It's not that easy. They're going to hurt me if I don't. They told me if I helped them, they would pay for Stephanie's treatments. The collector would, I mean. I looked up at him. They knew all about it from that first night. This person, whoever they are, they have connections. And now, they're going to hurt you. He sat back down, and I couldn't help but look at his fist. It was covered in plaster dust, but it didn't seem to bother him in the least. That was what they said. The one guy said, maybe I could get a hospital bed with my sister if I didn't play along with them. I covered my face with my hands, crying full force again. I've been waiting for them to come, I managed to confess through sobs. Oh Christ! That was why I didn't answer your calls. I didn't want you to be anywhere near me, in case they were watching. I figured, if I wasn't with you, you could still be safe. I'm sorry. I should have told you, but I didn't know how. I stopped trying to speak, since I barely made sense through the sobs and just cried. I cried it all out. It felt good to finally confess what I was going through, even if I was confessing to the person who stood to lose the most. I wished I knew how he felt, but he was silent. Even if he punched the wall again, I would know he was processing and reacting. The silence was unnerving. Then, I felt the sweetest thing in the world, his arm sliding over my shoulders. Come here, he murmured, rocking me. I cried even harder knowing he even wanted to hold me, after I'd lied so terribly. I'm sorry, I gasped when I finally regained the ability to speak. You don't have anything to be sorry for, he murmured, stroking my hair. They're using you. They're not making it easy, either. I can't guarantee what I would do if I were in your position. I didn't want them to hurt you, I whispered. I know. It's okay. I understand. His arms tightened. And now I know one thing for sure. It came out as a growl. My heart beat a little faster as I leaned back to look up at him. His face was like stone, but his eyes burned like fire. What do you know? I'm gonna kill whoever this collector is. And his thugs, for good measure. Nobody hurts you and gets away with it. Gajace. I mean it. He stroked my hair back from my face then wiped the tears from my eyes. Come on. We're getting out of here. What? Where are we going? Somewhere you can be safe. I won't leave you here alone, not if those pigs know where you live. Come on. He stood, pulling me up by my hands. Pack a bag. Quick. I did as he asked, without saying another word. He was what I needed. 
his strength, and protection. I would have gone anywhere with him just then. I didn't realize he was watching me until I heard his voice. You trust me enough to just pack up and leave with me? I turned almost speechless with surprise. I hadn't thought about it that way. Even in my fuzzy brain, the possibility that he might be luring me away to punish me for being a threat to him loomed up. But no. He wouldn't. I knew he wouldn't, because I knew him. It didn't matter that we just met less than, what, two weeks earlier. None of that mattered. Sometimes, two people saw each other for the first time and made an instant connection. Like they'd known each other for centuries. I trust you. I turned away, finishing the job before stripping off my pajamas and replacing them with shorts and a t-shirt. I didn't know what I would do about work or anything else in my real, actual life. Funny how Jace seemed more real, more true and substantial than any of the other things I once thought were so important. We didn't say a word as we hurried out of the apartment. It was a typical steamy, humid morning. I could almost see the moisture hanging in the air as we stepped outside. I locked the door, then took Jace's hand. He didn't move. He stood there, stock still, staring out into the parking lot. What? I craned my neck to see around him, and what I saw made me gasp. Shorty and Stretch were waiting in front of Jace's SUV, arms crossed. Well, 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 Stretch said with a smile. Look who we have here. Chapter 13 Jace Every nerve in my body was on fire as I struggled to keep from shifting. It was my instinct to shift when I sensed danger around me. What are you doing here? I asked, and my voice came out sounding like a growl. You know what we're doing. Why don't you come with us instead of making it harder for yourself? We've got a boss who would just love to meet you in person. The taller of the pair smiled wide. I'm sure they would, but I don't share their enthusiasm. Too bad. You don't have a choice. The short one looked at Gemma, who trembled behind me. Good job, girl. Stay behind me, I muttered. Unlock the door and get back inside. No way, she whispered. I'm not leaving you. I can take care of myself. But she wouldn't move. If we both got out of the situation alive, we'd need to have a talk about listening to me when she was in trouble and I was trying to protect her. Come on, Shifter. The tall one approached, a net stretched out between his spread hands. I laughed. You think that'll do anything to me? I turned my head a little so she could hear me. Back up. I pushed her away, then let myself go. I felt myself growing, stretching, changing. My animal mind took over, pushing the human rationale aside. I wanted blood. Lots of it. I lunged at the tall man, knocking him flat on his back with a roar. He screamed, terrified. Help, he called out to his buddy. I turned to him, my paws on the chest of the tall man, and roared. Instead of pissing himself, as I had expected, the shorter of the pair stuck two fingers in his mouth and whistled. In the blink of an eye, I was surrounded by four other hunters. Get him the hell off me. The tall man screamed and writhed under me. I roared in his face, so loud and close, the little bit of hair visible under the ball cap he wore blew back. Then, a net closed over me. I should have run when I had the chance, but I couldn't abandon Gemma, either. Not that it mattered. I caught a glimpse of her struggling against the grip of a tall, laughing man, dressed in all black. They had us both. Stop fighting. The tall one spat once he was on his feet again, one hand over his chest. 
You're only making it harder for yourself. You're going with us, whether you want to or not. I should have torn his chest apart and bathed in his fucking blood. I should have, even if it meant Gemma seeing me do it. He didn't deserve to live. None of them did. I roared, clawing at the net. I hadn't done anything to make things better. I had only made it worse. And I was about to be delivered to a sadist. Who else could they possibly be? Who would collect those of our kind and use them for fun? Suddenly, everything shifted. A stream of cars flooded the parking lot, and in a flash, their passengers poured out to encircle us. My clan. I breathed a sigh of relief, relaxing for the first time since shifting. There were at least twenty, maybe thirty of them. I saw Cord and Levi there, both of them with their fists clenched, breathing heavily. I'd seen them like that before. They wanted nothing more than to shift and tear my captors apart. Three of them ran instantly, disappearing behind the building and into the forest just beyond it. That left the first two, the ones who'd lured me by pretending to mug Gemma, and a third one who still held onto Gemma's arms. He held her in front of him like a shield. I was pretty sure he was pissing himself on the spot as he looked around, his eyes falling on one sweating, barely in control shifter after another. Levi raised one arm, pointing at him. Go, he growled, eyes blazing. He let out a roar that was nothing compared to what he could do, but that was all the man needed to hear. He ran, falling once, then twice as he fled. Gemma ran to me, throwing her arms around my neck. My father stepped into the center of the circle my clansmen had made. The two hunters were still there, looking absolutely dumbfounded. Dad looked down at me. For once, I'm glad you're so predictable, he muttered. I was glad to, if it meant him coming in the nick of time. Then, he turned to the hunters. Are you aware of the punishment for something like this? Attempting to collect a shifter? And no, one of them stuttered through chattering teeth. We don't bother with human police, Dad explained, his voice deceptively smooth. I knew the rage that ran just underneath it. We believe in taking care of things in our own way. Garbage like you, we kill. Immediately. It's not our fault. The tall one was as white as a sheet of paper. We were hired. We're just in it for the money. The short guy looked like he might drop dead on the spot. I wondered dimly what his blood pressure must be. His breath came in hard, short little gasps. Would he have a heart attack, or would it be a stroke? It doesn't matter, Dad said, silencing them both. He towered over them, even over the tall one, and was larger than the two of them combined. I could see why they were terrified, and that was without taking into account the nearly salivating shifters all around them, including me. I still saw red. I still wanted to rip them limb from limb. But uh, I also had Gemma's arms around my neck. I couldn't let her see something like that. Dad looked at me, and I nodded. I knew what he was thinking without having to be told. The two hunters took that nod as a signal to kill them, evidently. Please don't. Don't do this. We don't deserve it. They both wept like babies. The tall man fell to his knees, hands clasped. Enough. They went silent, blubbering without making a sound. I realize you're not the real problem. If I kill you, the collector lives. And if you're unwilling to tell me who he is, are. The tall guy spoke up. We've never met him. He'll only talk on the phone, and he uses one of those voice-changing things. You know, electronic whatever. We don't know him. But I would tell you if I did, I swear. 
Please don't kill me. Here's what I want you to do. Dad got in close, and both of them leaned away from him. I want you to spread the word far and wide. The Everglade clan isn't the clan to trifle with. Do you understand? Anyone who tries to collect one of ours will face the wrath of all of us. I don't think your boss, no matter how much money he has, wants to face dozens on dozens of wild animals. What do you think? No, no, sir. I'm sure he doesn't. Dad nodded slowly. Make sure you tell everyone you know what happened here today. We don't take this lightly, and those who think they can harm us soon find out otherwise. Do you understand? They nodded empathically. Good. Now go. They both blinked, frozen. Like they didn't quite believe him. What else do I need to say? He asked, glaring at them. You mean it? We can go. As long as you swear to tell your employer to leave our clan alone. We will. They both jumped to their feet and hurried off to the main road, where a car was waiting for them. They were gone in moments. With that, Dad looked down at me again. I'll want to see you back at the house. He glanced at Gemma, who still hadn't let go of me. You too. She tensed against me. I didn't blame her. Chapter 14 Gemma What does he want with me? I don't know. Jace drove us back to his father's home, wrapped in a blanket I'd taken from my bed. It reminded me of the first time we met, and the beach blanket I'd given him that night. I mean, he looked pretty upset. Yeah, he did. But can you blame him? We were almost kidnapped. They wouldn't have kidnapped me, I reminded him. They just wanted to hurt me. You don't know what they would have done to you. One of his hands closed over mine, where it sat on my lap. And you never have to worry about them again. You don't know that, I whispered. I'd never felt so happy and so miserable at once. I could only think about Stephanie. Had I made the right choice? I pictured her in my head, looking the way she had the last time I saw her. Painfully thin. Dark circles under her eyes. Trying so hard to be brave for me. I had just signed her death warrant. Yes, I had Jace with me, but I didn't have the money. His hand tightened almost like he knew what I was thinking. I hoped he didn't, or else he wouldn't be very happy with me. Who would be, if they knew the person whose hand they held, wondered if they'd done right by not turning them over? I couldn't have lived with myself if I'd taken the money. Every time I saw my sister, I'd think about Jace and wonder how Jace suffered to make up for Steph's recovery. There was no way out of the guilt all around me. The house? More like a mansion. I forgot my dark thoughts for a minute when we pulled up. Holy cow, I muttered, looking around in amazement. No wonder you could afford to do all that work on your apartment. Yeah, this is nice and everything. It doesn't really matter. He looked at me before we got out of the car. Here's what matters, remembering there's nothing he can do to hurt you. My father, I mean. So, he's going to threaten to hurt me? I ax, my voice trembling. No, but he can be pretty intimidating when he wants to. Don't let him scare you. I'm there with you, and I won't let him do anything to punish you for this. None of this was your fault. I hope he can understand that, I said with a laugh, but there was no humor in my laugh. It was terror. Would he want me killed, the way he'd threatened to kill the hunters? Come on. He got out of the SUV, then walked around to help me out. I held onto him for an extra moment, 
wishing I could take some of his strength for my own. I wished I could wrap myself up in his arms and never come out. He was the only thing that made me feel safe. But we had to go in, so we walked together into the mansion through the tall, wooden double doors. I wasn't too frightened to be amazed, and the beautiful woodwork and stained glass windows throughout the two-story entryway awed me. The office is this way. He led me to a room with carved pocket doors that slid into the wall on either side. His father already waited for us, his back to where we stood hand in hand. When he turned, he rolled his eyes at Jace's appearance. You couldn't find anything else to wear? Jace looked down at me, then down at himself. She didn't exactly have anything in her closet, Dad. Fine. Sit down. He pointed to the two chairs in front of his large desk. It looked like it had to weigh a ton, all carved wood polished to a high shine. He was a man who liked for people to remember what a big deal he was. Well, if I was virtually the leader of all the shifters in the country, I'd probably do the same thing. I sat with Jace beside me. Good thing too, since my knees knocked together. I pressed them together, my hands clasped between them. My name is Vincent. He hesitated, and I thought of the story Jace told me, about how they were called swamp water once, some time ago. He cleared his throat. When I'm out in the human world, it's Vincent Water. He was nice. I hadn't expected that at all. I'd expected a tyrant, but instead, I found a charming man who looked a lot like his son. And you're Gemma. Is that right? I nodded in response. Gemma, do you have any idea what almost happened this morning? I nodded again. Of course. You put my son in a very vulnerable position. I shrank back a little as Jace opened his mouth to protest. His father held up a hand to silence Jace. It's the truth, and I don't care how my son wants to paint it. You allowed him to walk into something that would surely have meant his death. How does that make you feel? Tears welled up in my eyes. Terrible, I whispered, chin shaking. This is absurd, Jace shouted. She's not a little kid in school, Dad. She knows what happened but it's not her fault. She didn't lead those guys to her place. They used her before she even knew she was being used. How many times do I have to ask you to be silent? Vincent's voice cut through the air like a blade. It was frightening enough to get me to stop crying. I didn't know what to do. Had he brought me there to kill me? To punish his son by making him watch? Vincent turned back to me. I understand that you didn't reach out to the collector on your own. You were targeted. I'm sorry that happened. It's always unfortunate when a human is pulled into our little problems. Little problems? Jay scoffed. Vincent didn't look his way. His eyes were locked on me. You're right, I whispered. I didn't reach out. I didn't even know what a collector was, really. I had never known a shifter personally, until I met your son. That's the truth? You're still sticking by that story? Why wouldn't I? I ask. It's the truth. All right. He shrugged, like it wasn't worth fighting over. I couldn't believe the audacity. Sure, he was the leader of the clan, but that didn't give him the right to treat me like trash. It is the truth, I asserted. And the fact is, if it hadn't been for the promise to pay for my sister's cancer treatment, I never would have kept quiet about meeting the hunters. But she's my sister. And the bills are already astronomical. And I don't live in a place like this. I waved my hands around, getting angrier with every moment that passed. 
so I don't have many options. But I still didn't lure your son. I didn't call him, I didn't do anything to trick him into getting trapped. He came to me. I can't help that they were waiting for him, I didn't know they were there. He sat back in his chair, mouth pursed, eyes narrowed. I could see the wheels turning in his head. He was trying to figure out if I was sincere. All right, he said again. I believe that. Thank you, I breathed, feeling faint as all the fight left me. Still, he continued, cocking one eyebrow, you didn't tell Jace about your predicament until it was almost too late. You should have come forward, instead of leading him into all this. It tells me that you were considering handing him over to the collector. I drew a deep breath. I couldn't lie. He would know I was lying, just the way Jace always seemed to. That sixth sense of theirs. You're right, I said. Gemma? Jace took my hand. No, he's right. For a minute there, I thought about it. I thought about my sister, how she's all I have. I turned to Vincent. Our parents are dead. We're all we have. So yes, I thought about it for a brief moment, but dismissed the idea. Still, you thought about it. I just told you I did, I whispered. There was no sense in defending myself any further. He'd already made up his mind about me. He wanted me dead. Why should I let you live, then? His voice was cold, crisp as he prepared to deliver my death sentence. No. Jace leapt to his feet. I won't let this happen. She's my mate. Vincent's eyes flew open wide. Your mate? He looked at me, then back at his son. You're only saying that. Jace shook his head. No. I knew it the second I set eyes on her, but I didn't want to believe it then. That was why I followed her out of the club, why I shifted to protect her, why I couldn't forget about her after that. He looked down at me. You feel it too. Don't pretend you don't. Otherwise, you would have let them take me. I had to nod. He was right. He meant way too much to me. It made no logical sense. There had to be something bigger between us. Vincent looked flabbergasted. This seems very convenient, he said. You'll see I'm right, Dad. Besides, you've been on my back for how long about finding my mate? I found her. She's the one. He pulled me to my feet beaming down at me. She's the one I'll marry, if she'll have me. It was all happening so fast. Marry him. We hadn't even known each other for two weeks. And he wanted to get married? It didn't make any sense. How would I tell my friends? Oh yeah, I'm marrying a shifter I barely know. No big deal. Were registered at Macy's and Omaha Steaks. Still, I had no choice. And it wasn't exactly like I didn't like him. Far from it. I could see myself with him, because he was right. There was something much deeper between us. Of course, I'll have you. I leaned against him, wrapping my arms around his waist. I couldn't help but look at his father, who looked like he'd just woken up to a real-life nightmare. Son, I want you to think about this. Dad, you know as well as I do that when the mate is found, there's no sense thinking about it. It's done. Right? He wanted to fight it, but there was no sense. I didn't know the ins and outs of mating in his world, what a strange word, his mate, but it seemed like a pretty unshakable tradition sort of thing. I was lost, floundering. But I wasn't kidding when I said I trusted Jace. I did, implicitly. Whatever he was doing was for the best. Finally, it was clear to Vincent that there was no getting around his son's wishes. 
So be it, he said. You'll be married in six months. I bit the inside of my mouth hard when I heard that. Six months? What? Jace's arms tightened around me, silencing the questions bubbling up and threatening to spill out. The first question, was I the only sane person in the room? Chapter 15 Jace We rolled back to my place in silence. I was still shocked with myself. My mate. Did I really call her that? The words I was so sure would never come out of my mouth, but there they were. And I was talking about her. And in front of my father. There was no going back from it. I didn't want to, either. That was the craziest, strangest part. I glanced over at her from the corner of my eye and saw her sitting stock still, upright, hands clasped in her lap. I didn't dare say anything to her, because I didn't know how she would react. Didn't they always say never to wake a sleepwalker? That was what she reminded me of, just then. A sleepwalker, sitting up with her eyes open, but a million miles away. It could have been the exhaustion. It could have been the announcement that she was getting married in six months. Once we reached the apartment, still silent, I took off the ridiculous blanket and dressed in my room. Gemma sat on the couch, just the way she had in the car. Say something, please. I sat in front of her, on the coffee table. I took her hands and chafed them between my own. Six months, she whispered. We're getting married in six months. It sort of looks that way, yeah. Did you mean it? She looked me in the eye, after avoiding my eyes, ever since we'd left Dad's. Mean what? That I'm your mate. It was my turn to avoid her gaze. I looked down at our hands. She was so small. So breakable. And I had to protect her because of that. She needed me. She brought something out in me that nobody else ever had. The need to keep her safe, keep her by my side. Because she was mine. Nobody else's. And if I say yes, I ax, studying our fingers. Then I'll know you didn't only say it as a way to keep me alive. No. I looked up, shaking my head. No, I meant it. I didn't know it was true, until just then. When I thought about losing you, I knew it couldn't be. I can't lose you. You're too important to me. You're my other half. I let go of her hands, leaning back a little. I know that's intense, but you don't know how important it is for us, shifters, to find our mate. It's everything. It's the continuation of our bloodline. It means we're, I don't know, complete. She nodded, thoughtful. I make you complete. You're really busting my balls over this. I just need to know. You meant it. I'm the one for you. I nodded, hard. I meant it. Then something hit me. Did you only accept because you didn't have a choice? I mean, we didn't give you much of a choice, did we? Marry me or die. I smirked, feeling like a smacked ass. Not the romantic proposal you deserve. It's okay. It's not. Especially since you obviously don't want to marry me. She frowned. Why don't you ask me for real and find out how I feel? It's just you and me. There's nobody to overhear us. Come on. Ask me to marry you. Just when I thought I couldn't feel any worse, I dropped to one knee. Her face was stony, blank. Unreadable. I took a deep breath. Gemma, I know we don't know each other very well. I know it's only been a little bit of time since we met, but none of that matters to me. Because when I first saw you, that first second, I knew you were mine. 
You were meant for me. You're the person I've been waiting for my entire life. It would make me happier than I've ever been if you would marry me and be my mate. She opened her mouth, then closed it. Hang on a second. What happens when I get older and you don't? I winced. It's a long story. It has to do with what happens when we, you know, have sex. I nodded. And when we have a family, especially, something about a shifter seed slows down the aging in humans. I know, it's weird, and there's been a bunch of studies done on it, but it's a fact. I couldn't be your mate for life, otherwise. Maybe we evolve that way. I don't know. But I know it's something we don't have to worry about. I chuckled. Wow, romantic moment broken. I needed to know, she said with a shrug. I couldn't agree to be your mate if I didn't know. Does that mean? She smiled, those full lips curving up at the corners. Of course, I'll marry you. I love you, you know. I had never said it before, and speaking the words out loud was scarier than I thought. I wasn't a man who feared many things. Opening up to her was one of the most terrifying things I'd ever faced. Lucky for me, I was rewarded. I love you too. She looked as amazed as I felt. This is crazy. I know. We laughed, touching our foreheads together. I had the whole world right there in front of me. She was everything. I'd finally found her. Our laughter dissolved, and before I knew it, we were kissing. It was sweet and passionate at the same time, but there was no urgency. We had all the time in the world. I loved the sound she made, the way she whimpered and sighed as I pulled her closer, the kiss deepening. I ran my hands over her body, warm and soft through her clothes. The animal inside me roared, wanting more. Wanting to rip the clothes from her and take her, mark her, make her always remember that she was mine and no one else's. Instead of doing that, I picked her up and carried her to my room. She wrapped her arms around my neck, and they stayed that way as we kissed side by side. I slid my hands under her shirt, then around to the front. I cupped one breast, teasing the nipple to a stiff peak. She moaned, her body straining closer to mine. Speaking for her, telling me about the need building up inside. I broke our kiss, rolling her onto her back so I could slide my tongue in a slow circle over that nipple, then the other. Her hands ran through my hair, holding my head close as her back arched and her hips bucked. Meanwhile, I explored her soft skin some more. Off came her shorts, and I caressed her ass before gripping her, digging my fingers into her flesh. I could only be gentle for so long. My other side, the side that was sometimes stronger and roared louder, wanted to take her. Hard. Fast. I raised my eyes to meet hers and saw the same desire there. Her mouth was half open, breath coming in sharp gasps. So good, she whispered, pulling my hair a little, massaging my head, my shoulders. I want you. Take me, please. That was all I needed to hear. I dug through the nightstand for a condom while Gemma pulled off her t-shirt, and I feasted my eyes on her curvy body. I couldn't imagine being able to feast on her again and again. Slowly, so slowly, I inched her panties down. She whimpered, wiggling her legs to help me with them. She was so wet, glistening, ready for me to impale her. I played with her, stroking her slit, watching her lift her hips up in time with my strokes. She whimpered louder, louder, finally crying out in relief when I made contact with her swollen clit. She closed her eyes, riding out the pleasure I gave her. Open your eyes. Look at me. She stared at me as I stroked, her hips moving, 
tits heaving up and down as she breathed harder and harder the closer she got to coming. Touch my cock, I growled, and her little hand gripped me, jerking up and down. I watched her and felt her stroking me at the same time. It was almost too much, but I gritted my teeth and held on. She was almost there. Yes. Yes. Her hips jerked upward once more as she stiffened, cries turning into whimpers as she relaxed. I need to be inside you, I groaned. She opened her legs in response, holding her arms out to me. What man could resist her? The scent of her sex enveloped me, filling my senses. I unrolled a condom over my straining length, then positioned myself against her hot entrance. Yes, she whispered, nodding. Please, give it to me. I drove forward, making her eyes fly open wide. She gasped, gripping my shoulders hard. I covered her mouth with mine, stifling her cries with my thrusting tongue. I thrusted in time with my cock, driving into her over and over. Faster. Harder. Her hips jerked up in time with my thrusts. Our bodies made a quick slapping noise as we crashed together. I forgot everything, letting my body take over, riding the edge between man and animal. I took her, rode her, made her mine. She was nobody else's. Nobody else would have her but me. She'd be mine forever. I grunted into her ear. Come for me. Let me feel the way I make you come. Yes. Jace? She threw her head back, screaming my name as her body shuddered beneath mine. She tightened around me, clenching down on my length. I couldn't keep myself from coming when she did that, her muscles milking me dry. I stiffened, crying out against her neck as I came. She was going to be my wife. My mate, forever. And she would be by my side as I led the clan. She would be my key advisor. She'd be the mother of my children. I love you, she whispered, stroking the back of my neck. And I felt her words moving through me, and I knew they were true. Epilogue Jace Hurry up, you. I swear, you'd think you didn't have a big day tomorrow. Stephanie still needed a wheelchair to get around most of the time, but planned to walk down the aisle the following day on her own two feet. Her treatments had been a success across the board, and I was proud that Dad had agreed to put up the money she needed. It hadn't taken much convincing. Once he did his own research into the truth of Gemma's story, he'd offered on the spot to pay Steph's bills. She wheeled up to us, pulling Gemma by the hand. Come on. You can smooch your husband tomorrow. She winked at me, giggling. Watching her get healthier by the day was like watching a miracle. Husband, Gemma said, like she was trying the word out in her mouth. That sounds pretty good. I'm glad you think so, wife. Her eyes went round. That's going to take some getting used to. But in a good way, yes. In a very good way. She kissed me once more, a lingering, tantalizing kiss full of promises. She would be mine, totally mine, by that time the next day. It's almost midnight, you two. Come on, you can't see each other after midnight. You know the rules. Steph finally succeeded in pulling her sister away from me. I'll put you on my lap and wheel you to your room if I have to. Oh, that could be fun. So Gemma climbed into her sister's lap, and they both laughed like little girls as Steph worked the controls to make the chair roll them both away, across the lobby of the hotel, where the wedding would take place the next day. Gemma looked over Steph's shoulder, waving as they disappeared. I loved watching them, together. I felt a hand clamp down on one shoulder, then the other. My cousins stood on either side of me, grinning, 
as they watched my soon-to-be bride rode away in her sister's lap. Didn't think you'd be the first to go, Hord said. Neither did I, Levi agreed. I was pretty sure the three of us would end up living together like some weird sitcom, I admitted. Phew. Good thing you met Gemma, then. Levi threw an arm around my neck. Come on. Drinks are on me. You didn't get enough at the rehearsal dinner. Listen to him, Levi said to Cord. Already talking like an old married man. What a shame. Nothing like the convenience of a hotel bar, Cord grinned. Not to mention the bridesmaids I saw walking in just a minute ago, Levi replied. They could have their fun. There was only one woman I cared about, and we'd be married in a little more than fourteen hours. I couldn't wait for the rest of my life. I hope you've enjoyed this Ava Benton book. Don't forget to subscribe and to ring the bell to be notified of new releases.